I declare the meeting open to the public. I invite any members of the public in. Um, I'll just start off by um, what says here to comment on the use of electronic devices. I suppose that's all electronic devices, so members are aware um, of, of uh, the issues around electronic devices um, and how it affects the sound system. Um, we know we had a wee bit of difficulty last week with the Hansard as well, so mm -hmm. Hansard will be in I assume today again with the Minister. No, there won't be. Okay, um, so it's just to make you aware that the mobile phones and stuff affect that. Members of the uh, public in the gallery as well. Um, just to make you aware that um, all phones have to be uh, switched off. Um, you can use Wi-Fi on your, your tablets if you need to. Okay, I, before the meeting begins, I want to welcome Claire Milliken to the committee team. Claire will be working with us um, uh, on the ad hoc committee considering the creation of the Bill of Rights. So you're very welcome, Claire. Good to have you with us. Um, agenda item number one, then we'll move on to, is apologies. We have an apology from Carol, and I know that Emma and Mark are stuck in traffic, so we're hoping that they'll be with us very soon. Um, so uh, that's as far as it is, and I know that, Robin, you have to nip out for a short time for an educational uh, issue. Um, I'll move on then to item number two, chairperson's business. Um, I know that Sinead had raised last week in the meeting um, the issue of me attending Ulster Rugby. First of all, I'll apologise for the committee for not informing them that I had attended Ulster Rugby. Um, it was something I attended, more looking at uh, women in, in sort of non-traditional sports that I had been doing, I suppose, before the assembly, before we got back. I'd been to a couple of boxing clubs and stuff. It was something I was hoping the Women's Caucus might take up. I apologise. It shouldn't have happened. I'm glad they've written in, though, to, for a meeting with us. And I, I know whenever I, they'd written in, I'd spoken to the clerk to say I would hope that as many um, committees outside of this building could take place in various venues. Um, so, uh, and I'm looking forward to doing that. I think we need to get out of here because of the tight remit we have with the, well, the DSD, old DSD functions in this committee. I think um, it would be good for us to get out around the, the more of those functions to do with sport and culture and art. So I apologise. Shouldn't have happened. It was naive of me, I suppose, in part, and silly in, in part for not mentioning it. So I will try and not let it happen again. I can't promise anything um, because sometimes uh, you, you attend something and then without thinking about it, um, you, you think, OK, um, I, I really it uh, maybe has an effect as being chairperson of this committee. So please accept my apology on that. Appreciate All right. OK, folks. Um, uh, moving on then to item number three, which is the draft minutes of the 20th of February 2020. They're page six of your meeting pack. Can I ask members if they're content with the minutes? Yes. Thank you. Item number four is matters arising. Uh, no matters are arising. I'll move on to item number five, which is correspondence, which is page 14 of your meeting pack. Um, I just want to ask, are you content as outlined in the correspondence memo? Yeah, I, I probably want to mention that the, tomorrow there, uh, we've been invited to the grassroots uh, event up at Windsor, isn't that correct? Um, I can't make it. I have uh, It's constituency day and I have constituency meetings in, but if any members can meet it, make it, it would be good. I know it's very short notice. It only came in to us, um, so that would probably... Uh, uh, for anybody that can go, it would be worth going to that as well. Um, as for anything else in the correspondence, are members content to note? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, then we've got item number six, which is ministerial briefing on departmental properties. Can I ask the minister and Tracy Maharg, the department secretary, to come and join us? Thank you for coming back to us um, to discuss this today. I, just, I don't know whether you heard or not, but we have two members who are stuck in traffic, so oh, yeah. hopefully they will get to here before not too long. So, uh, Minister, if you want to give us your opening statement. Yeah, no, just thanks very much um, for the opportunity to come in again. And I suppose, I mean, it is just to reiterate that I do look forward to working with the committee. Obviously, you play an important role in oversight and scrutiny, and that's a key area, but... I will be looking forward to having an engagement to look at solutions to some of the big issues that face this department and indeed our communities and residents in areas that we all live and represent. So 
the failed ways, even outside the formal structure of committee, as to how we can engage on some of the big challenges that lie ahead. And obviously, I will be doing the same across the executive in terms of cross-departmental working. I suppose I have been in the position now just over a month, um, like other executive colleagues. And obviously, it is a huge department with a broad remit, as you have just touched on. Um, and it's just really trying to familiarise myself across the department um, and making sure that I have that geographical spread um, beyond my own area of Belfast um, as well. So we've been doing a lot of uh, visits, getting to know organisations, meeting with groups and obviously receiving briefings from staff in terms of some of the key areas uh, that do lie ahead. And obviously the immediate priorities was to move on legislation that needs to be moved on by the end of March this year. So obviously we were in, I think it was last week, um, around the extension of the existing welfare mitigations package, the bedroom tax, the benefit cap and other existing mitigations. And obviously that is going through in terms of the accelerated passage uh, process. There are obviously other issues um, around the reclassification, the ONS reclassification, which will come up soon, and obviously it's in the schedule um, of bills to be passed before the summer recess, um, and looking at issues around that, and then obviously looking at the whole housing programme more broadly, looking at the revitalisation of the housing executive, obviously beyond social housing, looking at affordable housing, um, co-ownership housing cooperative development and obviously looking at the private rented sector um, and I know there's been uh, reviews and we're looking at those areas as well. Obviously in, in this before the summer recess obviously the, the liquor licensing consultation obviously it had closed just before Christmas and I'm reviewing the consultation responses and I know the committee um, have asked for that also and then the gambling consultation obviously has just closed um, and again once uh, my staff have reviewed all of those responses. There's obviously been huge responses to the liquor licence and over 1,500. Um, and then I would say there will be a high number of responses around the gambling uh, licence as well or consultation. So all of that will be reviewed as well um, in the time ahead and taking forward plans. I will be outlaying plans obviously in the time ahead around uh, social security um, and obviously any future mitigations that may happen. And I've been engaging obviously with key stakeholders along the way, not least departmental staff who deal with these challenges on a daily basis, but also the Human Rights Commission, the Cliff Edge Coalition, uh, Professor Eileen Avison, who had done the first round of mitigations along with um, Kevin and Advice CNI, and obviously trying to engage a wider uh, pool of people. Cliff Edge Coalition, just for example, you know, representing um, the Association of Social Workers that I met yesterday, the British Association. Um, the trade union movement, the women's movement, and um, a variety of others as well. So I'll be outlining plans in the time ahead. I know there's been a lot of questions coming in, um, obviously around PIP, around universal credit, around future mitigations or protections that we may do. And obviously we're also in tune to looking at what Scotland are doing, what England are doing, and indeed Wales um, as well, and to ensure that whatever we do, that it's researched, that it's costed, and that it would actually have the impact, but also being aware of the ripple effect of making a change to the system has on maybe other areas of work that maybe isn't as visual um, when you first intend to mitigate. So doing all of that, there will obviously be an update going forward um, around, obviously, casement in terms of the focus and the priority within the executive and the new decade, new approach to having Casemill Park developed um, as the outstanding um, stadia. The other two obviously have been completed and there was obvious legal challenges and, and delays that can be explained <coughs> as to why that hasn't happened yet. And obviously a review um, with moving forward as quickly as possible on the sub-regional stadia programme, but then also looking at phase two of that programme, which does include the other two sporting codes of rugby and Gaelic as well, and uh, just assessing that um, over the coming period. And then obviously there's a variety of strategies, strategies that are almost beyond their date, strategies that have run out, strategies that haven't come into place yet. Um, and I've just been familiarising myself with those in terms of looking at how we can move on those as quickly as possible, because again, I know organisations and sectors and people who are impacted by these strategies, be it the anti-poverty, child poverty, disability, sexual orientation, want to see movement on these things, um, and I'm assessing that. With the key focus, and again, I know members have raised this, of co-design, 
um, and ensuring that we do get the policies right, that we're engaging the sectors um, and that they're involved in the design of these policies um, in the time ahead. And obviously that will take time, but there is a commitment in new decade and new approach that we will have a timetable for the implementation and the rollout of these policies that a timetable to start that work will be presented um, by the end of March this year in terms of taking um, that work forward. Um, I think I'll just stop. Obviously, there is the arms length bodies, so there's over 21 arms length bodies within the department, so I've been doing some engagement. There's obviously challenges and reports and reviews and a variety of those arms length bodies. Um, and I'm seeking obviously legal advice, looking at the, um, the reports um, that have been done, looking at the audit, audit office reports that are being compiled around some sections of the arm's length body works, um, and just moving through those stage by stage um, at the moment. Okay. So I, I could talk more, but I don't want to. I don't want to. So. And I'm sure there will be plenty of questions, so you'll get an opportunity. Like, thank you. And I mean, I, I certainly understand there's a mammoth amount of work uh, ahead for the short period that we have got ahead. Yeah. And um, I know that you, as well as the committee, will be under immense pressure. Um, to get through a lot of that work. I certainly understand that. Um, I suppose just I'll ask a few questions and then I'll start to bring members in. And uh, I have a few more, but I don't want to hog the <coughs> hog the limelight. Um, probably, I suppose the, the first one is to do with the uh, the legislation that we we had you in um, a couple of weeks ago to do with the, the bedroom tax. Um, we know that has to be have royal assent by the end of March. Um, are we on target to to get to that? We are. I mean, we're trying to push for that to be presented into the Assembly, obviously through accelerated passage as soon as possible. Um, it was presented again at the Executive last week, and there's just some more information outstanding, which will be presented again, hopefully, for Monday's meeting. Um, we're also making um, assurances to, if there is a delay by a week, I'm hoping that it won't be, the payments will still flow and still be made. So we're ensuring that we're looking at all of those issues. But we are on course. Obviously, the bedroom tax component will be legislation, and we need to move with that. The other mitigations will be regulations um, that are being drawn up and on course uh, to be presented uh, to the chamber as well. I suppose then, just following on that then about the other mitigations then, uh, where are we with those? In terms of future or new mitigations? Well, future. Well, yeah. we, well uh, the mitigations that we have in place at the minute that need extended. They will be in the regulations, so they don't need the legislative change okay. the way the bedroom tax component does. So the benefit cap and the others yeah. will move through regulations that will move at the same time. Okay. So that's an amendment to the regulations to okay. keep those going, um, and they will move at the same pace as the bedroom tax. Okay. Just add uh, there to support the minister there that what we're working with DOF around putting provision in the budget act in the in the case that um, the legislation is not through in time, so we can continue to. Um, make provision so that they, there's not a, a stop in any of the existing mitigations. So we're, we're, we're talking to DOF about that at the moment. Okay, okay. Um, if I could just move on then. Um, I know we're, we're having a briefing later from um, the Departmental Deputy Secretary on housing, so I'm not going to go into too many specifics on housing, but it's just really to ask um, where we are um, when it comes to the, the housing executive and the changes that are going to have to take place within the housing executive uh, in order for them to be able to fulfil um, their role fully. Um, has that been explored in any depth as yet? Well, I've had um, an initial briefing just around some of the key challenges, and obviously it was in the first day brief. Um, and I suppose it will be no surprise to many around this table, the challenges that lie ahead around the £7.1 billion of investment that is needed over the next 30 years, and obviously three billion of that within the first 11 years. Um, and I suppose there are a number of proposals that will be presented to me as Minister in terms of taking that forward. And part of that will be looking at a revitalisation, a refocus of the housing executive. There are elements, obviously, around corporation tax and around the legacy debt that the, the organisation has. And I have raised that in a meeting a few weeks ago with the Finance Minister. Um, and we're also going to be working on a number of work streams collectively um, to ensure that we're trying to resolve these issues as quickly as possible and to ensure that there's that cross-departmental working. Because obviously, like many departments, these challenges are for across the executive and it's making sure that we are working more collaboratively. 
Some of it obviously will be around um, the rental streams of the housing executive, and with that, it presents a challenge. And obviously, there was within the news last week, obviously, the increase in 1.1% plus um, the CPI rate. There had been obviously a request from the executive to raise that by 7%, and the decision was taken not to do that because of the, <coughs> the concern and adverse impact that that would have on tenants and low income tenants. Um, and obviously, there's a wider challenge that when we're looking at the, the issue of housing, uh, the demand for housing, the levels of homelessness are those at least in housing stress. It's not just going to be resolved in isolation by you know, social housing building programme. We need to look more radically in terms of what we're trying to do across all of the housing programmes. But even when you look at the private rented sector um, and trying to regulate that more to protect tenants, looking at um, security of tenure, looking at other issues, um, we need to obviously <coughs> make sure that that's done in a balanced way, that it doesn't cause more homelessness by a jerk reaction as to how we approach um, these issues. So there are huge challenges ahead, obviously part of the debt and even trying to maintain the existing stock that the housing executive has. We do have to look at new financial solutions and that's what I'm working with officials within the department at the moment to see how we can raise the finance and how we revitalise the housing executive as an arm's length body to ensure that we can maintain the stock that's there, to ensure that it's at a, a good standard, that we are increasing the amount of social homes that are being provided. Um, and also looking at the affordability elements, so looking at co-ownership as well for people who choose to do that um, in terms of housing and obviously looking at the private rented sector uh, more holistically. <coughs> I think there is an opportunity as well to work with local government um, and local councils and in the time ahead I will want to engage with local councils because obviously as they develop their local development plans, there's ambitions there for growth. Uh, within many of the council areas, and that would be housing growth. Um, and it's making sure that as part of their growth figures and targets, that they are looking at the social needs that are out there. Obviously, we do have a breakdown constituency or council area by council area in terms of housing stress. Um, and is that aligned then to their local development plans, for example, looking at the issue of land availability in areas of, of high critical need? Um, which will also sit beside their ambitions to grow their population beyond that as well. So the engagement with local government will be crucial in the time ahead and to how these strategies within the department align and work closely with what their strategies around their local development plans are. So I suppose as I move through this process and we look at the potential solutions, um, we will bring that forward to the committee, to update the committee and then obviously the executive as we move through, whether that's a financial solution in terms of more investment in to upgrading the existing stock, but also looking at where we develop new <coughs> stock, whether that's in the social, affordable or private rented sectors. And I suppose just to follow on from that, I mean, whatever the housing executive looks like going into the future, whatever it might be, um, it, it, we definitely. I know that the the, the rent freezes that have taken place over the over <coughs> the years um, have had an impact, albeit not uh, as much as an impact as the debt and everything else that the housing executive have. Um, and I suppose just a concern or just something to flag up as well to do with rent increases is there are many of our tenants that are living in um, housing executive properties that are living in pretty poor standards. You know, so that's something that needs to be looked at when we look at rent increases. You know, can we increase rents on houses that still require a heck of a lot of work to be done on them in comparison to, to other houses? So it's not, you know, uh, looking at, at one size fits all when it comes to rents. I think that as an issue needs to that's be a considered. Point because it has to, residents have to see investment. Mm -hmm. So if there is an increase, um, then what is it that they're getting for that? And it is looking at it in a more rounded picture, because obviously the private rented sector as well, where we have twice as many children and families in that sector, and often that's not looked at, um, and the wider issue in terms of income, which feeds into the wider anti-poverty strategy and what we can do to really lift people out of poverty. Um, because we do broadly, when you compare Belfast um, and all of our cities and towns, when you look at the north compared to Dublin or even England and stuff, I mean, the rents here are lower. 
but the incomes are lower too, you know, so we do need to take a more rounded focus. Um, and that's what I'm saying. So for any move that we make, it has a ripple effect somewhere else. And obviously we don't want to make people worse off. We want to improve their life chances and their outcomes. So that's why some of these strategies will have to sit with others and we need to look at a more holistic programme, um, which has a variety of interventions. So that will take a bit more time, um, and that's what I'm trying to scope out uh, at the moment. But obviously learning from other areas as well, you know, so not just to look inwards. So what are other cities or towns or, or governments, um, legislatures doing in terms of resolving some of the issues that they're facing and then what works here? Um, but of course it is looking at the level of housing benefit and stuff and support that's paid, um, you know, a 1% increase that could have a big impact on families. So starting to test that out and then even what impact that has on the social security system uh, also. And again, I'll follow up to that is the, the, our, the private rental sector, which we would scare when we see the figures of the amount of people um, that are living within the private rented sector and the regulations around that. I remember I sat in the DSD committee when we were looking at the, uh, the registration of landlords and things like that. And when you look and you see how many landlords aren't registered, um, I don't know if you have any plans going forward to look at mandatory registration, to look at um, the, the certain requirements around those private landlords when it comes to you know the, the, the conditions that people are living in and even the testing <coughs> of, of their utilities and all of those things because they're not being done. And some of those houses people are living in um, certainly as a constituency MLA we get to see that and you would know yourself that you're living in dreadful conditions. No, well that's it and the, the private rented sector just recently when you look at the breakdown has more properties than the social rented sector in terms of social housing so it's a growing area obviously the amount of private rented housing has doubled in the last 10 years than what there had been previously. Um, and there are challenges around this. Obviously, I am looking at what we can do to strengthen protections in the private rented sector to look at issues of security <coughs> and tenure, looking at the issue of regulation um, going forward. Obviously, here, maybe unlike other places, again, uh, it's more of a cottage industry where there's a lot of land. We have a lot of landlords that maybe only own one or two properties. Um, and that's around, I think, I think it's between 80 or 85 percent of our landlords here or that type of landlord. So it is difficult then when you start to look at um, how you can get all of them aligning. Again, I do see a role and there will be engagement and research working with local government. So when you look at the HMO scheme um, and how that's being managed, you know, each local authority has their own building control, environmental health section. So are there things that we could be doing there? Um, as we're looking at these solutions going forward. Ultimately, obviously, we don't want to, we want to, to have a viable housing plan overall to ensure that we're reducing housing stress, that we don't have homelessness figures increasing, that they are decreasing. And as I say, that will be a match of between public and affordable housing, private rent, et cetera, will play a key role in that as well. And obviously, the, the main focus is to ensure that people do have a place to live, they have that security of tenure but that the quality of housing is of a good quality. Um, so it's looking at that in the time ahead. It also will need, in terms of looking at the regulations for new housing bills, so to make sure that they are meeting a standard um, and a high standard going forward so that any new future housing stock um, really is sustainable in the longer term. So maybe learning the lessons from old housing stock and things that weren't done to a certain standard. So looking at the standards of new bills um, and the planning system in the time ahead also needs to be addressed in terms of future proofing for housing stock as we go forward. Okay. I have just, just two more issues. One is still related to housing and it's to do with the um, reclassification of housing and where we are now with that. I know that again that has to be something that is, uh, has to be put through pretty quickly. Um, and I know uh, the ONS have a, a major role to play in that. Um, and I suppose it's just to see where we are with that. Uh, when we expect to see that coming through the assembly, and then also um, what conversations you've, your department have had with ONS around them um, turning this around, you know, in, in, in a timely manner. Well, we're hoping. Obviously, it was one of the priorities. It's in the schedule for um, the legislation to be done before the summer, um, and we'll obviously I'll be moving on this with the executive in the coming weeks. Um, in terms of moving the required legislation through, obviously to change that, to reclassify 
um, the classification uh, that was given and to try and do that as urgently as possible because obviously as the longer it goes on it's having an impact on our housing build programme and the capital finance that we have available around issues such as co-ownership so we have to move quickly and that's why accelerated passage um, is needed mm -hmm. in this case yeah. to ensure that uh, we're retaining that capital budget. So we are moving on that. There's obviously been engagement with the ONAS, but again, once we make the required changes, they will need us a certain level of time, and as, as yet, we're not sure what that is. Uh, we don't have the influence to say you need to do it by uh, this time, but we are trying to engage as much as possible with them um, to move through those hoops. So I'm hoping in the coming weeks, obviously, I'll be coming back to the committee um, with having moved on this issue because it needs to be done as soon as possible. Okay, and just lastly, before I bring members in, um, you would mentioned there about the liquor licensing. Um, uh, we are hoping, all been well, that we will get a, it's in our forward work programme for a, a consideration <coughs> next week. Um, and I, I know from uh, general public and interested parties, they are very keen um, to see this put through sooner rather than later. Um, I just want to know if there's any hold-ups from your department on that, or is that now on schedule? No, yes, and again, it's in the schedule in terms of before the summer recess um, to move on that. Obviously, the consultation closed. There's been over 1,500 responses. Staff have been analysing those responses, and they've been engaging with me. There had been draft legislation there previously before, obviously, the institutions and that come down in terms of looking at this. So it should move pretty quickly um, in terms of some of the outstanding issues. There have been changes, obviously, in that time around some of the microbreweries that have been created. And obviously, we've had to respond to that um, to look at the issues and engage with the industry and with those breweries uh, more broadly. I've met with Hospitality Ulster. Um, in the last couple of weeks, and obviously I've seen articles from the microbreweries and the campaign that they have been doing as well. So again, I'm just analysing all of that. I know you have a briefing next Thursday, I think, um, in terms of the consultation response. And again, I'll be moving on my recommendations um, as soon as possible, like in the, probably in the next month, um, to kind of move on that to ensure that we're in time before the summer recess for that to come into the formal process of committee and the chamber. Okay, thank you. I have a few more questions, but I'm going to open up to the rest of the meeting first. Um, I have Johnny, then Kelly, then Mark. So, Johnny. Thank you, Chair. And again, I would echo your comments. I would welcome the Minister and the Permanent Secretary. Um, I would indeed agree there's a mammoth task ahead of your department. And again, as a committee, we have been uh, studying over and still much more to be done in terms of priorities uh, and how, after three years of inactivity, we can really uh, put uh, money to best use. And it's in relation to those priorities that I would just like to draw the Minister to issue number three within our first day of brief, which is namely Casement Park. Can you maybe confirm to the committee, I know there's been recent speculation um, that an additional bid of £33 million was made to the executive, but can you maybe uh, make comment on that or confirm or deny it to, to the committee? Well, no, there's been no letters, so some of the press um, that has been out this week around that um, is not true. There's obviously, it's known um, that the budget has increased in terms of, and we don't know the final figure yet because planning. Um, has not been granted. It's still the application, obviously, is still in the system. Um, part of those costs, then, in terms of the increase, so it's now nice sitting at around 110 million is the estimated figure um, for Caseman Park. Um, obviously, with part of that contribution coming from the GAA uh, themselves. Part of that has been because of the, the legal challenge. There's obviously been a redesign of the stadium um, to look at the concerns that were faced from residents, but also to address the legal challenge around health and safety issues. Obviously, we had the technical safety group set up um, to look at these issues as well as they were moving through resubmitting the plan and application. Um, and the other part of that increase is around inflation, so just the increase in inflation over that six-year period from when uh, the Caseman Park was to be developed. We won't know the full costs um, until planning, the outcome of the planning decision, and then we can go into <coughs> the formal procurement process throughout. Obviously, I'll be engaging with executive colleagues and obviously the Minister of Finance. There is a commitment, obviously, a new decade, new approach to complete this programme. The stadia programme was for three stadia. 
and obviously Windsor Park um, and Kingspan have been completed, with just this third one um, to be finalised. And then obviously looking at sub-regional um, in the time ahead as well and the commitments that are there for you know, I, I know New Decade and your approach commits to completing the uh, regional and sub-regional studies programme, but th there's no mention of overspend. Do, 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 maybe could you, do you intend to make an additional bid to the executive? I know you maybe don't have a figure on, but if it's estimated 110 million, um, 33 million, is that your intention to do that? Well, all of the figures still have to be worked out because obviously there's contributions from the GAA as well. Um, I don't know the final figure until um, the planning application, um, if it's been accepted and then we move to the next phase. Um, and then we look at that. The increase in the spend has been in somewhat uncontrollable because it is around addressing the safety issues. And obviously public safety has to come first. Um, so there was a redesign that was needed for that purpose, um, which can't be avoided. Um, and then also the issue of inflation, because this was to be developed, but obviously with a legal challenge, there's no way around that. There's nothing that you can do. Um, and the JR then followed um, its own course. So once the figure is known, then I will be speaking to the Minister for Finance and also the executive around next steps. But there is a commitment to develop the third and last stadia as part of that overarching stadia program. I just, just want to say I don't think there's any um, argument in terms of the redevelopment and the need within the, the regional and sub-regional program. It's the overspend, and I think there will be a lot of shock from uh, not only maybe member members within uh, the assembly, but also the wider public. You know, this week we listened to the Minister of Finance talk about a 600 million black hole in the budget. We have listened in this committee over this past few weeks of the major challenges facing your department and priorities such as welfare and housing. Um, do you really believe that a potential uh, additional bid of 33 million or in around that, whatever it may be, is best use of public money? Well, I think any delay in any capital project has an impact then on the finances. So I don't think that it, it would be a huge surprise that if there's a six-year delay in any capital programme, that that would have an impact on the finances. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges, um, and we need to look at these uh, projects in the round in terms of the health outcomes um, that a facility like this would have and the impact that that would have then on future demand, for example, within the health uh, service. So sometimes you have to ask the cost of not doing these things. It obviously has been long awaited. There are uh, valid reasons for the delay. Obviously, there was a legal process. Um, the judicial review uh, found against uh, the last plan and application that went through, and you had to go through that system again. You couldn't usurp that process in any way. Um, and it's just the lag of a six-year um, time. There had to be a redesign to listen to the genuine concerns and also the outcome of that judicial review. And again, I have to reiterate, public safety was the number one um, concern here. The redesign has been done. It's now within the system again. Obviously, there are budgetary pressures, and we need to look at all of these issues in the room. But again, I do go back that there, there is a commitment um, to deliver on this programme. It's not just about the sport per se, because when you look at the other two um, stadia, it's the health outcomes that they are also developing. It's engaging children and young people. It's looking at issues of reducing antisocial behaviour. And these do have impacts on other departments. You know, when we had an executive away day a few weeks ago, in terms of if you're engaging children and young people in sport, looking at reduction in health inequalities, looking at children avoiding entering into the criminal justice system, which all have massive costs if they engage in those services and systems, um, by encouraging sport and activities like this, whether it's in Gaelic games, soccer, rugby or any other sport. Um, does have a positive impact in the long run. So that's. No, I mean, Minister, the, the, the overspend is concerning, more well exceeding more than double of Windsor Park and Kingspan combined. Um, you've mentioned the contribution from the GAA. Do you agree with their current position uh, that uh, no additional uh, increase in terms of their co contribution is viable at this stage? I think Kingspan and Windsor were upgrades, so it wasn't a matter this is a new build. Um, and there is a difference there um, in terms of that. And I think that is important. Obviously, the GAA, in terms of the financial split at the moment, it's an 80-20 split from what the, the first part of the programme was. 
once we know the outcome of the planning decision, then we'll have a more definitive figure. Um, and discussions are ongoing with the GAA around that. Will, will your department be asking the GAA to increase their contribution given the spiralling costs? The once I know the final cost, those discussions are ongoing with the GAA, um, but obviously <coughs> with the uh, Finance Minister around what the final budget will be. But I can't give that now because I don't know. I mean, I think from the, the public concern uh, perspective, uh, asking the public taxpayer to foot the bill of an overspend as opposed to an organisation such as the GAA, who recorded a, a record annual revenue of almost €74 million Euro in 2019. You know, I think rightly questions from your department needs to be asked in terms of how can they up the potential contribution to allay some of the concerns there is in relation to the overspend. Well, this is a programme that's being run by my department and the executive, so it's government that's delivering on the stadia the way we did with um, the other two stadia. And there was some of those stadia, there was no contribution from the other sporting codes um, in terms of some of the upgrades and essential work that was needed to be done. Uh, there is genuine reasons for the delay in this project, um, and that was legal reasons, um, which were upheld in a court of law through a judicial review. And obviously that has led to the delay in the development of this. Now, nobody wants to see that delay, but health and safety has to come first. We have to address the, the genuine concerns around health and safety and put in remedies that to ensure that if a uh, stadia of this scale is developed, that people are safe when the stadia then opens. And for me, that is the overriding factor for public opinion, to ensure that a stadia like this is safe um, and that we do all that we can. I obviously... The attempt will be to keep loss, or sorry, costs as low as possible, and indeed engagements will be ongoing, um, and we will update the executive and indeed this committee as we move through that process. Sure, just in probably my last question, if, uh, thank you for your indulgence. Um, and move, you move me on to, to my, my next question in relation to planning concerns. Um, given, as I've said, the proposed overspend and, as you have mentioned, the planning concerns in relation to safety. We know the, the residential area and the problems that that has caused, whether that's through um, safety issues with, with uh, emergency evacuation plans, road accesses, etc. Is there not a simple solution, whereas for the acceptance of reducing the, sky, the size and scale of the project in terms of capacity would overcome these issues that you've mentioned? Well, the capacity in the new application has reduced. So the overarching capacity from what it was six years ago has reduced. But that has to be balanced that these are regional stadias. So they're either a regional stadia or they're not. That's the same with Windsor and the same with Kingspan. They're either regional in terms of the numbers that it's driving or it's not. My understanding, obviously, the planning process will take its own course of action. The minister responsible will make the decision on the advice that they're given. Um, I understand that the, consult the statutory consultees um, have responded. I'm not aware of any um, undue concerns around issues, but that process will take its own course. I'm hoping that we will know that in the foreseeable future, what the plan and decision is, and then we will work from there. I do know that when uh, pre-application, there was an extended period of consultation that the GAA undertook with the communities up to 32 weeks rather than the normal 16 weeks. And I think that was in recognition of the need to engage with communities um, that live there. But this is a regional study and it's about the broader impact as well. But planning will look at those issues of health and safety. They'll assess that there was a, an advice group that was set up for this purpose. They have obviously fed into that advice and public safety was number one. And the planning process will then determine the outcome of that. I, I'm not de denying the point about regional, uh, but to compare the two, I think the proposed uh, capacity for the new stadium would be 34,000. When you compare that to Kingspan and Windsor, which is in the region of 18,000, I, I feel that if um, the capacity issue was looked at, potentially you could see progress, um, both reducing costs and alleviating the concerns that you've mentioned in relation primarily to safety. Well, it has progressed, and it's now in the second plan and application that's in the system. So we wait the outcome of that plan and application. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Kelly.
Thank you very much. Just going back to the original study, I think the Minister would agree with me, it would be lovely to see that amount of money spent on women's and disability sport. Um, I know that women and others will occasionally use these venues, probably casement actually would be used more often for camogie than the other stadium would be used for women's football or women's rugby, but um, I'm hoping that a bit of gender proofing might be considered in future capital expenditure. But just getting on to one of the concerns that I have um, with regards to housing, we've had a number of years where the Audit Office has raised concern um, about the maintenance um, and the expenditure in the Housing Executive with regards to that. Um, will the Minister finally grasp this and um, shake it by the, the shoulders and sort out why the, the Audit Office's concerns about maintenance, and I'm particularly concerned about the Disabled Facilities Grant. While there has been a review of that, I have to say the co-production on it wasn't that good. I know that there was a project, and I know that other people were involved in it, but the maintenance issue for houses, we have mould in houses that shouldn't be there, and it continues. It's not being stopped. The Disabled Facilities Grants need a complete and utter overhaul. Um, it's just not working um, well for people. Um, so I just would like your opinions on that, please. Well, I think this feeds back, as opposed to the earlier conversation around the future investment in the housing executive and revitalisation. Um, and you can't do one without the other. Um, and so I am looking at that seriously. Um, it, as I said before, it's no surprise these challenges have been known for a while. Um, and obviously they have been with rent freezes and all of that situation has um, deteriorated further. So it is a priority for me in this short two years left of the term to go um, to ensure that we start to put it on an appropriate footing. Um, obviously we have discussed the issues of rent, but there's other solutions that we need to look at as well in terms of attracting other investments in um, to resolving the issue of the disrepair. And that's been due to a lack of underinvestment over decades. You know, this just hasn't come overnight. This has been over <coughs> decades of underinvestment, and that has to be recognised. And we need to ensure that we're getting it right. So I will be working with the finance department to look at a longer-term plan and strategy um, in terms of ensuring that we do have housing fit for standard uh, in the existing stock. Um, but it is important that we look at this in the round in terms of going forward, that we have new homes that are being built that are fit for purpose um, in the time ahead. Because we looked at issues, I mean, houses in, in a community that I had been aware of, that um, when you looked at the issue of fuel poverty, there was no cavity wall installation. You know, and these are houses that aren't even 40 years old. Um, and that's just not good enough in terms of when you're looking to future proof. So we do have to work with planning. We do have to look at the regulation and the standards for new bills going forward, um, whilst also addressing these legacy issues. So it is a priority for me. I know the team, uh, my own team, and you will be getting a housing briefing um, just from Paul and that behind me and Tracy uh, later. But it is, I mean, we urgently need to do this because it is impacting on residents. And as the chair touched on earlier, if you're asking people to look at rent increases what investment are they getting for that? Um, and we have to be serious to look at that. So it is a priority in the time ahead. Um, the disabled grants, we're looking at that also. So I can feed that back. And again, more than happy to talk um, outside of this committee yeah. around those issues further. Um, just to, to pick up on that, um, rural areas, I have to say, um, it's like the forgotten houses. Um, I would ask the minister, during that process if they could actually ask tenants to feed back on some of the quality of the workmanship of the maintenance that's being done and why people are having to ask over and over again for things to be repaired when they're not actually being repaired properly in the first place. Um, but just moving on from that, um, the right to buy scheme, ONS reclassification will be coming up and right to buy will be included and is put alongside that. Um, will there be or is there intention to have um, at least a period of time where people will have the opportunity, the final opportunity to buy those houses and what would be the plan use of the money that's generated from that? Um, and will those houses be replaced? Yeah, well, the ONS reclassification in terms of right to buy for housing associations will be one thing that will be looked at in terms of ONS, um, because that's a stipulation. Obviously, there's the issue of the right to buy for housing executive properties, and some of this is part of that broader housing challenge, because as we have new bills coming on, there are a few hundred then that are being lost at the other end um, in terms of the right to buy. Um, I'm conscious then the need to engage and consult on these issues um, in the time ahead. 
uh, whilst addressing that challenge of the right to buy. I also want to look at the areas of co-ownership um, and affordable housing and having a, um, you know, a more balanced in terms of looking at those issues and can we increase investment. And again, that's something that I'm looking at in the time ahead to ensure that we off are offering people as much choice, but it's also about building sustainable communities as well. And again, the importance of working with local councils, because councils do have ambitious plans for growth, but how do they ensure that those who need it the most, so those who are on the social housing waiting list, or maybe those that can't afford high-end rents, how do we ensure that we have towns and cities um, and rural areas that are inclusive, you know, that we don't have social segregation. Um, we're obviously living with the legacy of overcoming religious segregation, but I don't want to see an issue arising of class segregation um, within our cities and town spaces as well. So that engagement with uh, local government, with local development plans, um, in terms of where we're going over the next 10, 20 and 30 years uh, will be crucial in terms of the overall picture. I'm glad to hear the Minister talk about that. My concern is that community planning has a flaw in it. We're designing communities for today, not for 30 years' time. The roads into developments are not wide enough for public transport, so in the future when diesel cars and possibly petrol cars will be off the road at the same time, we're not enabling communities to have access to services. I have huge concerns that planning is not taking that into consideration. We already have people who are on the mobility scheme who are investing in electric vehicles who cannot actually charge those cars at their homes, so I would be hoping that the Minister will be working with the Minister for Infrastructure to consider that going forward. Like, for instance, to have a scheme at the moment where you can't get a drop curb outside your house because the width of the garden through planning isn't wide enough that you can bring a car up to get charged. I'm hoping that will be overcome. There will be a meeting planned with the Minister for Infrastructure, so on the back of the briefing that I had done with my staff team in housing, just the fellas and that behind me, um, there was the need to do a meeting with uh, the Minister for Infrastructure even around connection to the water and sewage system and we know there's obvious challenges there so if we do have ambitious pr plans to grow our housing stock in the time ahead there are infrastructure challenges so part of that meeting is to get um, an overview with the Minister to present the challenges around housing um, in the time ahead and how we can work more collaboratively together to overcome those challenges and also involve in the Minister of Finance and indeed the whole executive team and I do think it has been good in this executive up until now that we've had two away days as an executive team um, to look at some of those broader challenges because it's easy to sit within a department and say I want this or I need that. We need to address these more collectively um, as a society and as an executive um, in terms of those challenges. So that meeting is being planned at the moment and I've spoke to the Minister um, and she's more than willing to do it. I have just two final questions. Can I ask a question supplementary on the housing stuff? You were asking there about the buyback as well, the housing executive. <coughs> um, over, uh, over time have, have looked at various buyback schemes of houses that were previously sold um, within their within their estate. Um, is that do you hope to continue with that? I mean we all know of houses in various estates in our, in our own areas that are boarded up, that are you know, that there's there's issues around those and the create anti social behaviour and whatever else. So would it still be your intention to, to look at that sort of bypass? Looking at all of that and then obviously even the empty homes and stuff in terms of bringing them back in. Um, and obviously the assessment will be in terms of what we can do with the money that we've got, do you know, is that to renovate and to bring up, or is that looking at new build programmes? So I'll be assessing all of that in the time ahead. And I suppose again, it's looking at the picture in the widest sense, because a lot of the, the social housing that has been sold off is now within the private rented sector. Um, and so obviously, all of these issues, whether it's ONS reclassification, looking at the right to buy and what we do in the future, um, whilst also looking at a, a housing programme all have to be knitted into a broader strategy because for one thing that you move will have an impact or a ripple on the others. Um, so I'm keen to, to have a coherent strategy going forward that we know this is what we're going to do in the next 10, 20, 30 years in line with changing trends and populations and how people are going to live in the future so that people are clear that this is what we need to do and here's the financing and the infrastructure that's needed um, going forward. Okay, sorry, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Just talking about ripples, I have a question for you that, that comes into our dreaded universal credit. Um, sanctions. Um, I have a number of constituents who come into my office and they have been sanctioned. 
because for many different reasons, but one of the key reasons has been that they have not got a clue how to use the online system. Um, and I was wondering if the minister or her team or officers would have any um, objection to doing a report on those that have been sanctioned, those who cannot pay their rent during that sanction, um, to see why they have actually hit sanction. Is it just a case that they haven't kept up to date with their online reporting system? Because um, of the people that I'm seeing, they genuinely don't know how to do it. And is there a way that the department or um, those that can can phone these people? You know, when they start to see somebody's heading towards a sanction and they have been updating their whatever their job record is, um, can they get a phone call rather than just being hit straight to sanctions? I had a person in the office other, the other day who thought that their housing was going to continue being paid while they were being sanctioned. They didn't even realise that their housing was stopped. So for six months, they're going to accumulate a, date, a debt and probably get, because of other issues, probably get evicted. Um, I was just wondering, is, is there a review happening about those sanctions and the impact? Do you want to yeah. um, I mean, obviously, the minister's talked to us about sanctions. Um, sanctions obviously are not handed out lightly. There is a process to go through, um, and I mean, when I'm in, you know, the the offices, our staff very often are trying to support people to ensure they don't get into sanctions. But the minister has asked for a paper on this. Yeah. Um, I think there's 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 probably an issue around. We need to make sure there's consistency in 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 sanctions, um, and that how we take this going forward. Um, so we will be briefing Minister Whip to be, but we haven't actually. The Minister has raised the issue of sanctions with us. Um, the, obviously, sanctions are part of the, um, the welfare system, uh, and therefore we need to think of the repercussions if we moved away from sanctions completely. But we just, we, we're, we're going to prepare some briefing for Minister on this so she can consider what, yeah. what her views and on that I are. I think that's come on the back of engagements that have had up until now. So the early days, obviously, looking at extending the existing mitigations has led into conversations about future mitigations that might appear. And as I say, I'll be outlining my approach in the coming weeks around engaging with communities, engaging with the sector, um, the advice sector and others around what future solutions or mitigations that we could be looking at um, in the time ahead. And obviously sanctions have come up heavily within that. My approach in, um, even in terms of is around incentivising people rather than sanctioning or punishing people because these are the poorest within our society, at times the most vulnerable. And it is understanding, you know, if someone didn't turn up for an appointment, then why is that? Um, and we, you know, it shouldn't just be jumping to a sanction. But obviously, um, it is to have the time engaging with staff around if a change is made, ensuring that there's no negative ripple effect from a certain change, because obviously any chink in the system has a knock-on effect. So I have asked for a paper to look at all of those, and importantly, engaging with. Um, the advice sector, um, some of the organisations that I named earlier, around are there small changes that we could make, are there extra supports that we could look at in the time ahead that avoids sanctions um, and that it actually incentivises people rather than punishing them. So that's something that I'm keen to address um, in the coming months and indeed over this mandate. As somebody who represents a rural area where broadband is atrocious, mm -hmm. um, could I just say, can you please in the department, catch yourselves on. There are people out there who are using um, pay-as-you-go mobile phones. They don't have PCs, they don't have laptops, they don't have access to all of this stuff. And the pay-as-you-go, you can't access the online services that you need. And you can't turn around in a rural area and say, go to the library because the libraries are shut half the time. They're not being invested in. Um, you can't go to an office because the office is 15 miles away. And if you go on one bus, you'd be lucky if you get back tomorrow. Um, so I would just say that there needs to be a consideration. There are people whose ability to read and write, like 33% of professional drivers have difficulty with their literacy. Um, why do we expect everybody in the world to be computer literate? Not everybody can afford a big iPhone. Um, I think we need to be realistic. And now, after this process has been in place for a while, I would like the sanctions to consider, is the online system one of the reasons why people are being sanctioned? Um, just finally then, I want to move on to the strategies. Um, I'm, I'm not behind the door. I'm the chair of the all-party group on disability. Um, the disability strategy is something that I would really like to see taken forward. But, Minister, I am sick 
to the back teeth of hearing other departments saying that's for communities. What will there be within those strategies to ensure that there is cross-departmental commitment to this so that we don't see infrastructure cutting transport in rural areas for disabled people, that we don't see um, other departments taking forward, say, for instance, investment in courses in areas that are inaccessible for people with learning disabilities? Um, what, what will you build into your strategies or how will you build into your strategies targets that can be measured to show that it is actually working cross-departmentally? Well, I've had an initial briefing on all of the strategies going forward, and as I say, I'll be bringing forward um, a timetable in terms of when we're starting to move on these. Part of that, um, for all of them, will be a co-design process. So I know one of the concerns from the disability sector and those who represent people um, is that they don't feel that the previous strategies have been fit for purpose. Um, and so co-design will be key. Now that will take a bit longer just by the very nature of how you involve and engage with stakeholders. Um, but for me, this isn't going to be just a strategy for my officials within the department. It has to be officials from right across all of the departments involved in developing this strategy and a co-design process with the sectors themselves. So that's the approach that I'm going to take for all of these strategies. I will be lining out, um, so from my initial meeting, I'm looking at the terms of reference for the groups, the co-design groups going forward, a list of who should be involved. Um, obviously, you'll have a, a smaller group, but then it's how they engage with wider stakeholders, and particularly with people who maybe don't connect into a group. How do we reach those people as well to hear their views um, in the time ahead? And I'll bring that back <coughs> to the committee. And indeed. If there's any ideas or suggestions of who should be involved, whether it's in the disability, whether it's the gender, the anti-poverty or the child, you know, feed them into me or into the department. Um, and then when we have the terms of reference, uh, the groups and the kind of approach that I'm going to take, I'm more than happy to come back into the committee to kind of outline that um, in the time ahead. I think um, the, the all-party group on disability held a meeting here. Oh, uh, the end of last summer, I think it was, um, we had 80 people with disabilities. And the one thing they said was being involved as part of the co-production and co-design is one thing, but getting the feedback and the proof that this is working is another. Um, so that's why I was saying about yeah. is there going to be targets built into this? I think the ensure? big thing with all of these is establishing a baseline. Um, and that's going to be critical because if we're looking at outcome focused um, and delivering, we have to have a baseline of where we're starting, and there is no clear baseline. So establishing that as part of this work is going to be key. So it will be stakeholders. It will also be those involved in research or academic study around this as well. Um, and then importantly, the departments are critical from across government, not just within the Department of Communities, because whilst we hold the oversight, you're, it can't just be this department. Um, dealing with all of those strategies and so officials from each of the other departments need to be an integral yep. part going forward but having that be a slime will be key um, and also the assessment from within the department as well because it's one of the areas even looking at mitigations around social security um, you know there have been studies and baselines done of potential figures if you were going to mitigate against something but having the ability to scrutinise that figure because the department will have information um, because those figures may be an underestimation um, and it may not be the, the, the money that we need to resolve or the, the resource. So having all of those involved and having that baseline will be critical. But Absolutely. again, I'm more than willing to come back around the terms of reference, what that baseline established and that's going to look like and who will be involved and kind of from the, the working groups then, how we engage with people at the grassroots as well. Thank so. you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. you. Uh, Sinead? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, but, so I know you gave a brief overview and I'm, there's a couple of um, points I want to touch on as well. And, and again, thank, thank you both for being here um, today. Um, I suppose I'll start with casement. Um, and I think what amazes me is that people are amazed that there's an overspend. Um, we, when we consider the fact that the project had executive and program for government cover, yet it was allowed to languish um, for three years, while successive um, permanent secretaries from a range of departments passed around like a hot potato. Um, I know one of the last meetings myself and um, Paul Maskey, the MP for West Belfast, one of the last meetings we had with the Department for Infrastructure, we were shocked to find that there's one full-time planner working on the, the, the plan application for a casement. When you consider the size and magnitude of that plan application, to find there was one full-time planner. Now, people can be um, cynical and, and draw their own conclusions as to why 
that was. I have my own um, my own thoughts on that. Probably not best to share in public. Um, not enough planners. <laughs> well, yeah, not enough planners. But I mean, you know, we we seen things like the the Belfast Transport Hub. Um, an application that went in that was submitted to Belfast City Council after the casement plan application, and we've seen we've seen plenty of planners can be found to advance these projects when the will is there. Um, I often hear, saying, and, and it's been whipped up recently in the media as well, um, people decrying the size of, of the, the casement park project, and I often find that that call comes from people who have little or no understanding of Gaelic games, and um, probably never been to a GA match in their lives. And when you consider the fact that the 2019 Ulster final had 30,000 people in attendance um, at that, and I know the, the, um, the aspiration for Casement is that potentially it could, it could hold all Ireland quarterfinals, um, which can um, see attendance as um, much higher than that, up into the, uh, the 16, yeah, 70,000. So um, for, for people to say <coughs> simply downsize it, it does show they have an absolute um, you know, lack of understanding of, of Gaelic games and the absolute magnitude um, of how popular uh, that, that sport is across the island. Um, so I think, you know, while nobody's advocating that, that we don't be physically uh, physically uh, responsible, um, I think I often find that all, that comes when, you know, OK, my, I've, my own path has been sorted out. It's up to you now to be f fiscally uh, responsible. Um, and I don't think that the quarter of a million gales across Ulster should be should be punished for the fact that there, that there's been no ministers here to take uh, those decisions as, as we've been told should be the case over the last three years um, one of our last meetings with uh, your predecessor was uh, uh, Leo O'Reilly um, we talked about the business case for placement um, so obviously the focus now will be on the the Minister for infrastructure um, and again as I said, one of the, the, um, the, the things we kept hearing over the last three years is we can't take these, these decisions because there's no minister. There is a minister now, um, and, and we'll have that fight with her in terms of the uh, decisions that she should be making. But um, if and when that decision is made in the not-too-distant uh, future, um, Minister, is the business case in an advanced stage? Is it ready to go, um, or, or is there work still to be done on that? The business case um, was given in, in November. Um, obviously, I've met with officials uh, twice in terms of casement. I'm now asking for a weekly briefing, an update um, on progressing that. So, uh, because the situation when I first went in is, I don't want once planning is dealt with and whatever the outcome of that is um, will be, but to ensure that everything within my department is ready to go um, on the casement proposal. So we are working on target um, in terms of that at the moment. And as I say, I'm now asking for weekly briefings around that and also the stadia program, uh, the sub-regional uh, as well, to ensure that it is a priority that we will deliver this as part of the remaining program around stadia development and that there is no undue delay in the time ahead. So once we do that, we'll obviously move to the formal procurement process, which will firm up those costs. Um, there are some ongoing discussions just around community benefit and all of that, but we're not waiting around on the plan and application. All of that is moving um, at pace, uh, with my most recent briefing just having happened on Tuesday uh, morning, So, and then I'll be getting a follow-up briefing next week. So from my point of view, there will be no undue delay. This is um, a facility that needs to be developed. Um, as soon as possible. People have waited over six years now, and as I've said earlier, there, there were reasons for that. Um, but now is the time to move to deliver this project. Can, yeah. sure, can I just very quickly come in off the back of that and what some of the comments? Well, just, just wait, if you wait your turn. If sorry. Yeah, just some of the comments that were made, sure. I find them deeply uneasy in the fact of we're continually hearing about pitting sorry, our. Sorry, no, no. Just just could could please, just, just, I chair in this meeting, so please could you be quiet? I, I understand, um, Andy, that you do have concerns, and I will bring you in on that. Absolutely will, um, if you can uh, continue. And I know, um, uh, as chair of this committee, I, I, I know the great work that all of our sporting um, fraternities do. And um, I, 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 I haven't been to a Gaelic game, I certainly haven't. Uh, I have been to Croke Park to many concerts, and I've seen the size of it. It's massive. Um, so, uh, and I understand why you want to come in on that. But if Sinead, if you can continue, and I will, br I, I will bring you back, Andy. Yeah, I'll be short, uh, Ter. Andy, I'll be short. Um, yeah. I was patient with everybody else. Um, so, it's a couple. So, the sub-regional um, stadia 
uh, project. Um, and I know maybe other, other people will touch on it, and we, we've spoken about this before, but um, my concern is that, because uh, the, the last consultation was five years ago, um, and just obviously how out of date that is now, um, and I just wonder if the Minister could give us uh, her thoughts on the designated grounds list and whether that, would, that legislation would actually need updated prior to any movement being made post the consultation process. Um, sorry, I'll, just, I'll, I'll rattle through my issues here and then maybe we could just answer them in, in bulk. Um, just in terms of the, the gambling um, consultation as well, you will know that um, Sinn Féin has, has submitted uh, our party proposals around the regulation of gambling. And one of our um, key proposals is the introduction of an independent gambling, gambling regulator. Um, and our proposals would, um, would ask that that, that uh, independent regular sit, regulator sits outside the department um, for lots of different reasons, but um, probably the, the main one being that they're, so they're not susceptible to lobbying or, or anything like that. So I wonder what the Minister's um, thoughts are on that. Also around advertising in terms of problem gambling, um, my understanding is that we because that, again, that's one of our key proposals. Um, we don't actually have the powers to, um, to, to actually influence that. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, you know, I think that should be uh, any reform of gambling law should uh, should regulate advertising, advertisement, whether that's on TV, radio, whether it's to do with uh, sports teams. And I know a lot of the sporting codes have been very proactive in that, and that's very very much welcome. But we do need to crack down on the absolute bombardment at times um, through advertising, through TV and, and radio that, that people are, um, are getting. Um, on the liquor licensing, I'm not going to dwell on it either. Um, my, I'm coming from this from, from the point of view of, of the craft brewery scene and um, just from a, a local perspective in South Down, we have a, a really um, blossoming craft, craft uh, brewery scene who could be a major player in terms of our, our tourism product in South Down, um, but our liquor licensing laws are very restrictive um, in terms of them being able to get their, their liquor licence, the cost of it being, being one. So while we're not wanting to, um, to increase the burden on already licensed premises, um, uh, we want a, lev a level playing field there, but we want to make it easier for craft breweries to, um, to grow their product um, and to be able to, to contribute to local economies and local tourism economies. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Um, I suppose the issue around the, the sub-regional stadia, I mean, as was touched on, this was a programme from 2011, um, 2011 and then 2012, obviously in line with an IFA report that was done. And at that time, obviously, the sub-regional stadia phase one is around soccer provision. And obviously there is. Um, so when I come into post um, just over a month ago, I have asked for a quick update because time has lapsed. Um, so just like the casement issue where there has been a, an, upgrade, an updated sorry, full business case, I have asked officials to quickly engage with the key stakeholders within the soccer fraternity um, around making sure that all of the assessments and plans that were in place back in 2012 are still fit for purpose. There was a bit of an interim review back in 2016. But again, that's nearly four years out of date. So I've asked for um, a quick review and assessment. Obviously, I do understand um, within the football, they're waiting on this programme. Obviously, facilities are, are deteriorating further. And one of the key aspects is around health and safety at ground. So I do want to move on this as quickly as possible. I'm committing to do that as urgently as possible. And then again, also looking at the phase two of the programme, which looks at the other two sporting codes that sit with the regional stadia. Um, and particularly looking at issues like of participation around women mm -hmm. um, and looking at the issue of gender, touching on the issue of disability as well and how we can have facilities that are fit for purpose and future-proofed, looking at all of those things. So I'm still waiting on that assessment coming back um, and obviously there's been changes even within the IFA rules recently I know have caused some concerns amongst intermediate football. Um, and obviously, I'm just asking for all of that to be brought back, and I'm just waiting on the outcome. But I do want to move on this as quickly as possible as well, because I know groups um, and clubs and teams have been waiting a long time. So I don't want, again, just like the casement, I don't want any undue delay. But I do want to um, satisfy myself that if public money is going in, it is going into the right places and those um, who need it the most. Um, the issue of gambling, uh, gambling sorry, um, obviously the consultation has just closed on the 21st of February. I haven't had a briefing yet in terms of the responses. Obviously, they're being analysed um, at the moment. 
and that will take just um, a bit of time um, for that analysis to be done and then to be brought to me. I haven't engaged any groups. Obviously, there have been requests in from those who who want to see tighter regulation and maybe those who don't. I haven't engaged any while that consultation was opened, but I will be meeting with organisations and individuals impacted um, on this issue in the time ahead just to listen to what they have been saying. Um, and then moving forward in due course with uh, recommendations that will obviously come into this committee in terms of scrutiny and then through the assembly at the different phases. But there's no doubt that it needs changed. It hasn't been looked at in a long time. There's obviously been the surveys that were conducted, I think, in 2011 and then in more recent years. Um, and the legislation needs to respond to the, the changes um, in this area. The liquor licensing one, I mean, I touched on. Um, I'll be moving on that soon. Um, there has been the analysis um, of the consultation and what people's views are. Obviously, you will be getting an update at the committee um, in terms of that uh, next week. Um, and the issue of craft breweries has come up as a new phenomenon, I suppose, in the last couple of years from when the legislation uh, was previously looked at. And obviously, there is an issue around um, granting um, a licence, and I think there are things that can be done. Um, to address uh, the needs of those companies, those employers, and how we can grow that in terms of tourism potential um, in the time ahead. So I'll be outlining my plans or my, my focus around that, and then obviously again uh, that will come into this committee in, in the coming months. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just a, oh, another question Sinead had asked her was around the advertising. It's not correct, Sinead, to do with the gambling. Yeah. I, I know um, any of our sports grounds, not that I'm in too many of them, I have to say, but you do see it on TV where you see gambling constantly as advertised within yeah. sports. Uh, you, you, you well, it's an issue that's obviously going to be looked at. I know with, uh, some players' associations yeah. and all more recently have actually called on mm -hmm. a reform and an abandon of this um, going forward. And obviously, even you know, advertising has come up in the liquor licensing consultation, yeah. and looking at that as well in terms of where it's sold. So these issues, I mean, have been changing over the last couple of years. They've changed dramatically, I suppose, the landscape in the last ten years. So I will be looking closely at that as well as part of the gambling consultation responses. Okay, thank you, Andy. I've added you to the list of speakers. No problem. But first of all, I have Mark, and then we have Emma. Mark. I have a wildly way at the moment. <laughs> um, so I am the, obviously the chair. Yeah, and okay. apologies for missing oh. the start of your presentation, Minister. There was a, a serious enough looking multiple car collision uh, on the road. It's clear from this morning's discussion if we, we hadn't already known. Uh, you have a huge volume of extremely important uh, work to do, and while our role as a committee is to scrutinise that work, it's also our role to assist you with it, and I look forward uh, to doing that, as I'm sure uh, we all do. I, I, I'll just brush, I suppose, slightly over some of the issues that, that, that have been raised before. Uh, they're, they're too important for me not to mention. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that, that, that the Department is engaging meaningfully with the, the, the sector when it comes to looking at how we extend and strengthen uh, mitigations. We had a, a couple of useful uh, evidence sessions last week uh, from groups. In terms of new mitigations, for example, oh, example to mitigate against elements of welfare reform, or, or actually not the welfare reform bill, but the work, welfare reform and work act that came after that, uh, are they being considered and, and how might they be ruled out? I'm thinking, I suppose, primarily of the two child rule that, that didn't exist whenever the original uh, mitigation package was drawn up. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the liquor licence, and although, although <laughs> you haven't got to it yet, I, I know that is attributable to the volume of work that you do have, but it, it still remains uh, a priority. And I was wondering if there is a separate or bespoke piece of work being done in terms of reviewing entertainment licences, or are they being done alongside each other? I think that's particularly pertinent if we think of high-profile incident <coughs> tragedy uh, that this happened almost a year ago uh, here. Housing is a hugely important issue, of course. Glad to hear that we're looking at empty homes and how they can be brought back to life and uh, brought into use. I mean, it's, 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 there's something perverse in the society where the, the, the number of empty homes rises at the same time and, and the same level almost as the, the, the rate of housing need or homelessness. 
You touched there on, on uh, working to on with councils and their local development plans, and uh, th th that they have to have ambition in terms of, of, of growth and how they accommodate housing. It's my understanding that perhaps some of the councils, if not all of them, have demonstrated a wee bit too much ambition uh, in terms of housing growth, and that if, if you were to add up <laughs> all their projected growth, it will far outstrip any NISRA predictions for population growth in, 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 in the same period of time. So I, I think that's something that needs to consider, and again, that will be done in conjunction with DFI, I suppose, uh, with, with their planning re remit. Uh, Another one that's causing huge concern in my constituency and I'm sure others, but I, I think the new minister should do something to make it as clear as possible to well, us as politicians, but more importantly the, the wider public, and that's around the phasing out of post, use of post office accounts for uh, benefit uh, pension payments. This is one, uh, you know, there have been a couple of attempts, I think, yes. to do this. It's caused huge confusion and distress. And I have to say, attempts that I've made to get clarity over a number of years has probably led to more confusion, to me being more confused and, and making thanks. more people that way, because there, there have been mixed messages. And like I say, it, it definitely is causing uh, alarm out there. I, I, I wonder, Minister, and I know you have an awful lot on your plate, but have any consideration been given by you to revisiting uh, the Pensions Act that saw the acceleration of the equalisation of the pension age here? Just wondering, given the, your party's position on this issue in the South, which I welcome, in terms of, of keeping the pension age where it was or bringing it back to where it was, is that something that you might have uh, considered politically? Uh, I'll declare an interest. Uh, on Casement Park, because I'd been Environment Minister who made the decision to award planning permission to it in the first place, one that was ruled by court to, to have been, I don't know if it was necessarily the wrong decision, but it was a decision made wrongly, and that's why I, I would caution a wee bit, you know, this idea that we pressure and push the Minister to make the decision. The Minister will make the right decision in this, so that I'm confident, not just because she's a party colleague, but what's most important, not just that she makes the correct decision, but that she makes that decision correctly. So it is important that departments uh, work together along with the applicant, of course, to ensure that everything is on the table. Because I think what, what, what had happened, and I'm not <laughs> making excuses, I made the decision based on all the evidence and information that I'd received. And there was, <laughs> there was information that hadn't been given to me, uh, basically, regrettably. And, and it is very regrettable that we are where we are. Or, well, we aren't <laughs> where, where we aren't in, in terms of that stadium. Housing executive uh, maintenance issues, uh, hu huge indeed, and uh, as regards to disabled facilities grant and adaptations, huge issues there. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's quite depressing, actually, that in the past month I've been to a couple of weeks where someone had had an adaptation cried out of their house and the adaptation's basically ready in time for the wake. You know, the, these people over the past few years have been fighting for this, their families have been fighting for it, but there's so much red tape, so much rigmarole to go through. It, it, it's not fair to expect that of anyone, but especially not someone who, who, who's disabled or, or, or very sick. But well, Thank you. No, thank you. I don't know if I missed something. Come back to me. Um, there was a lot there. I suppose the extended mitigations, obviously the, the focus in the last couple of weeks has been around extending the existing mitigations and we're on course and ensuring that the payments still flow whilst that the legislation is changed and the regulations are updated. Um, I will be outlining plans in the coming weeks in terms of looking at what future mitigations potentially we could be looking at and obviously there has been a lot of commentary around this uh, from the sector themselves. When I met with the Human Rights Commission in the first week of coming into post, obviously they had conducted a report, a detailed report, uh, looking at potential future mitigations, which included the two-child rule, and they had costed some of that up, and some of those future mitigations are anywhere in the region of 180 million additional in terms of future protections. I met as recently as yesterday with the British Association of Social Workers and obviously um, the issue again of the two-child uh, policy and I know the Attorney General has raised concerns. There are legal challenges as well and we will await the outcome of that. 
not just on the two child rule but obviously on other aspects in terms of a breach potential breach of human rights um, being raised as well and obviously staff are engaging and looking at those in the time ahead all of this then in terms of what we need to do going forward is to ensure that the costings or the proposed costings because as i said earlier there are concerns that some of the figures that are being put out could be an underestimation of the cost and so we need to really do some analysis and work that if we are going to mitigate uh, going forward that that is costed so that if we are looking at an additional financial commitment that we we have really done the research and know that that is the figure albeit benefits can change um, in the time going forward so i will be looking at that seriously in the time ahead also looking within the system that it could just be a change in how we do things um, can make a huge um, impact and i know looking at the issue of terminal illness for example there's been a lot of work done with Marie Curie and others um, around making some changes in terms of what we can do existingly uh, within the system to fast track or to ensure that those people who present are fast tracked within the system to ensure that they are getting the attention and the focus that they need so for me again in keeping with the, the aspiration of co-design working with the advice sector and with those who, who deal with people on the ground is going to be key in ensuring that there is that crossover with our own staff um, in the time ahead and I'll come back and update uh, people on that um, in terms of what future mitigations. We're also obviously looking at Scotland and changes they have made, but again, we don't have the cost analysis of what that will mean in terms of the two-year rule and what there was, sorry, the six-month rule and how they're extending that out. We still haven't got the analysis um, of how much that's going to cost in Scotland, and obviously that's what we'll need to look at. So we're, we're looking at all of those areas um, in the time ahead. Entertainment licensing obviously is being looked at at the moment, and it's by the same team that's doing the liquor licensing review. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm aware of the awful incident, and it is a priority that we do move on that um, as soon as possible. Um, the liquor licensing, I mean, as it's touched on, that will be coming. It's in um, the plan, obviously, the legislative timetable for before the summer recess. But obviously, then there's. Um, deliberations at the committee stage um, and for that to be done but that is moving um, that I start to present that to the executive uh, in the coming period the issue more wholly um, I touched on at the start around housing and obviously disabled facilities um, grant adaptations um, are being looked at but um, the, I suppose the standard of uh, housing executive properties and even looking at the private rented sector is a huge issue in terms of um, older homes, a lack of investment over decades, um, and it is a big challenge that we're looking at in the time ahead around injecting more money into the system to ensure that we have the capital there to um, bring these properties up to a standard. So um, I'm doing a review of that at the moment. I know you're going to get a more intensive housing briefing after this, um, but it will be looking at issues around rent, um, around capital investment, and maybe also looking at alternative financing models. And again, we're starting to look at all of those issues as to how we address this um, as quickly as possible. Um, there's probably more that I have forgotten. Sorry, Sorry that the future method of payment um, is something that obviously um, PWP are leading on, and we're working alongside them on that. Um, it's you know it is the actual the objective is to find new and innovative methods of payment. Um, it's to be honest with you, some of the things that have they've been looking at haven't moved as fast as we'd hoped. Um, but we we will have to sort of make sure that we look after existing customers through whatever method that is. The minister hasn't yet been fully briefed on this, so um, not so, so I I'll just answer that one. Okay. Okay. Pension age, you know, oh, sorry. The, we're looking sorry. at that in the time. So obviously, there's been um, confirmatory procedures around private pension um, in terms of the public pension. That's all being looked at at the moment. So yeah, just one, one yeah. other point for clarity: the completion of casement or this been successful uh, plan, planning application. It will allow games and events to uh, be held here in Northern Ireland. That, 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 that of a scale that, that we currently can't do here. So it'll be good for Northern Ireland PLC. Yeah, of course. Thank you for that, Mark. Okay, Emma. 
Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Deirdre and, and Tracy. And I, can I just apologise as well for my lateness? I was caught up on the same uh, car uh, problem this morning, albeit coming from a, same, a better same part traffic, of the Same traffic, I'm not the same. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, uh, so Kelly touched on, on a lot of what I wanted to ask in terms of the strategies. Obviously, I'm the party's equality spokesperson, which means in the wake of NDNA and the spokesperson for strategies. So um, I just wanted to add a wee finer point about, and obviously you've already answered that there's going to be co-production, co-design, and that the, the three-month um, deadline might not just be had to hear to, and I can understand that's understandable. But just in terms of the, the gender pay gap, um, obviously S19 is already there as part of the 2015 Employment Act, which was never implemented. Um, and that rests technically with Department for Economy. And it's saying here that it technically sits with the Executive Office, but it's expected that um, the Ministers will complete that transfer back to communities. Is there, does that, has that decision been made or where it's... Sorry, what's this this is the yes, 19 of the Employment Section Act. Section 19 of the Employment Act, which was the remit of Department for Economy. So it's yet to be convinced by the Department for Economy, yeah. which has responsibility for it as far as I'm aware. Um, so um, basically, we'll be working with them on taking that forward. Okay. And again, it's something that we haven't had. Yeah, much well, of a met with um, the minister yeah. just um, two days ago on Tuesday, just to look again at um, cross departmental working. Um, so obviously, this is one of the areas that we're going to come back to, um, and to ensure that we have given the authority of officers to go away looking at this issue um, and also employment programmes and training programmes, ESF and stuff as well. So. There will be a programme of work emerging um, between the two departments um, in terms of some of these issues, so we'll update as we go along. Yeah, no, it's just that that we element is sort of like oven ready, it's just reporting, yeah. which is, it's not going to solve the problem and there needs to be like a wider strategy, but it just, yeah. there's something. No, it hasn't come yet, but yeah. No, that's all right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emma. Sorry. Andy? You asked the other strategy. Sorry. Sorry, just quickly on the three-month timeline was never around the strategies being ready. There was an agreement. That right. was just around bringing forward a timetable of when the strategies are going to be developed and at a point then that they can be signed up to. So that is due by the end of March and then we'll move on. But it will take longer in terms of the strategies Working if we're going out. to do a co-production and co-design. Um, but obviously I want to do that. I don't want unnecessary delays. But obviously, working with the sector and ensuring we're engaging across the board and into the grassroots will take a bit longer. Okay, thank you, thank you, Minister Andy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and the reason I wanted to come in very quickly, Chair, is I want to place on record, and I know um, that I was in the media in relation to casement uh, very recently, uh, and some of the concern may be arising and emanating from that. I want to place on record, obviously, my party do not um, intend to stand in the way of casement, and, and we want to see the, the project delivered. However, where we are raising concerns are the projected estimates around costs. We want to dispel some of the commentary around, you know, just because one patch, i.e. some of the other regional projects, may have been delivered, yep. that some people are attempting to stymie casement. That's certainly not the case from our perspective, and I know um, that's not being suggested towards me. Uh, in that respect, but I just want to make that absolutely clear that the commentary around casement is not about attempting to uh, derail the casement project. Um, the executive made a commitment. We are on board with that commitment. We have concerns around any projected cost increase, and we will scrutinise those as we are required to do so. Um, in that respect, so, uh, Minister, if I can just come back in your first day brief uh, in relation to the Housing Executive. Um, there's, there's a mention around uh, capital deal uh, and, and the unaffordability um, in terms of the, the executive's uh, capital deal budget to be able to meet the demand and needs of the housing executive. And there's some suggestion of then the requirement for commercial borrowing. And there's obviously uh, aspects that emanate from that in terms of the housing executive, the private re or the, the landlord section. Um, is there any more developments in, or, in respect to that, in, uh, enabling the housing executive to borrow, or, or, or changing the way in which the housing executive operates? Okay. Well, firstly, on the the casement stuff, I know the point you're making, mm -hmm. um, and I suppose if any of these projects had been delayed, it would have impacted on the cost mm -hmm. just by sheer inflation and if there had been for the reasons of the delay, obviously it was health and safety and a redesign. Um, the issue around the housing executive in terms of obviously 
I am looking at this holistically, so part of it will be around the revitalisation and changes that are needed within the housing executive. Um, I had a meeting yesterday, even looking at the private rented sector, and obviously addressing the future of the housing executive and some of the demands that we have around the, the budget and feeding into maintenance. And I've asked for a scope and paper looking at um, financial solutions going forward. Part of that will be a discussion with the Minister of Finance, and I raised this with him when we had met a couple of weeks ago, um, around looking um, at the capital budget, looking at the issue of corporation tax, and then obviously issues around the legacy of the debt. So I'm waiting on those assessments coming back to me um, in terms of how we can generate uh, more revenue, but also looking at issues of borrowing um, and where potentially we could get that from um, as at a lowest rate as possible. So we're looking at a, a variety of solutions and, again, conversations with local government as well in terms of what they can be doing. I know there are some areas, for example, you know, looking at strategic site assessments, trying to identify land, which is a critical issue uh, going forward and using public land for that greater public uh, good, uh, housing being one of them. So I will present this. I don't have a definitive kind of plan of direction right at this point, but when I do, I will come back to the committee and present. Appreciate that. And sure, um, remission of AI perhaps should have placed on record uh, an interest in respect of being a private rented landlord. And, and indeed, uh, I agree with the comments around obviously us being heavily dependent upon the private rented sector. And it's imperative, obviously, that we have the, the correct regulation in place so that tenants are given security of tenure and they're safeguarded in terms of the state of, of the properties. And indeed, I've seen those uh, and, and the lack of, of, of repair in respect to those. So we, I look forward to working with the Minister in respect to bring that forward. Minister, um, just moving on to another area, uh, universal credit, it's been a, an area of um, deep concern and I know in many respects we're stuck with a system in which we have to operate within its parameters uh, and we're at the mercy of DWP. I'm just wondering, um, and it may be that we can do very little, but um, the five-week wait in terms of payment, is there any engagement with DWP in respect to that? Um, indeed, I'm seeing on the ground a lot of constituents being impacted adversely in that respect. I know we have the advanced payment. Um, however, from a budgeting perspective, a lot of constituents are still being adversely impacted in terms of budgeting and being able to pay that back on a monthly basis. There's an ongoing engagement um, with DWP in terms of any analysis that we have. There's obviously an ongoing engagement with the advice sector themselves, and obviously my department funds the advice sector. Um, and I suppose we're always open to looking at better ways of receiving the information and to look at how this impacts on individual families and people. And so we'll be continuing to feed that into DWP in terms of looking at that. Um, as universal credit is ruled out. So, <clears throat> as I said earlier, in terms of future mitigations and protections, this will include looking at universal credit and are there changes that we can even make to the system temp at the minute. Obviously, the discretionary payments and that, there are unique circumstances that happen here um, that maybe don't happen in other jurisdictions. So, we will be looking at are there more that we can be doing in terms of protecting people? Can we reduce? Um, that time scale for when they do get the first payment and other other things that we can do um, to support people in the first five weeks. So uh, we'll be looking at that in the common period, engaging closely with the advice sector um, in the common period. And indeed, I know I'm meeting with yourself, um, Andy, next week, just in terms of so if there are any suggestions that members have, I mean, more than willing, and our staff are more than willing um, to engage on it. So it will be an ongoing review of this. Um, to see what further protections uh, we can build in or what changes potentially we could make to make it easier for people. Yeah, and, and indeed, Minister, I appreciate your proactiveness uh, and engagement on, on these, these matters, and I look forward to meeting you next week and we can have a, a broader conversation. I know a lot of the areas have already been covered and, and touched upon. Uh, an area that I've raised on, on numerous occasions, and the Permanent Secretary will be aware of this um, from previous meetings with herself, um, discretionary support line. I still remain, uh, and I know we had officials in front of us um, recently, uh, and there's work ongoing and it's continuing to be evaluated. I still have concerns. Just again, recently I had a constituent in my office where a member of staff had to spend a period of two and a half hours going through a discretionary support application. Um, my fear would be it was a very vulnerable constituent, and had she been um, doing that application herself, um, she would have most likely um, 
stopped uh, and wouldn't have engaged. And indeed, the time period in which those calls are being answered remain to be very lengthy as well. And I, I know of a written question in respect to that as well, Minister. I'll pick that up um, with staff and I'll come back to you on that. Yep. Um, just declared interest as a trustee of a charitable organisation, and Minister, uh, I don't expect you to be able to give me a full overview in respect of it, and I'm sure you know where, where I'm going with this in terms of the Court of Appeal recent ruling in respect of uh, the Charities Commission. Um, I'm sure the Department will be considering that ruling. Um, can you maybe shed some more light? I know there's been numerous questions in relation to the Scott report review, sorry, and so forth so on. Are, are we going to see that any time soon? Well, I think I've met with the Charities Commission. That was one of the, the arms length bodies, obviously, that have met, and that's because of the, the issues that have mm -hmm. arisen. Obviously, the court decision has just been very recent, as um, late as last uh, week. Um, and I'm reviewing that. Officials are looking at that and what the implications for that will be um, in the time ahead and obviously looking at the, the information from Scott. I don't know if it was like a planned review and the way people think that there was this okay. separate independent review that was conducted because that's not the case. But obviously there are implications from the court judgment and even what the judge said because he went beyond just making a judgment. He made a, f a further statement in terms of any future um, regulatory change that we may make, and obviously I'm assessing that um, at the moment. Um, and I suppose it is an important role that if we have commissioners there, you know, commissioners are there for a reason in terms of decision making. So I'll be looking at all of this in the round, obviously taking into account the judgment, which has an implication, um, and to see what we can do as quickly as possible in order to get the backlog um, and applications and considerations dealt with as soon as possible. So. Once all of that's been reviewed and I've considered it, I'll update members in due course. Appreciate that. And Chair, I think I'll leave it at that. There's various other issues I could raise, but I'll, I'll, do, it next I'll do it next week. <laughs> OK, thank you. Johnny, did you want to yes, come back as thank well? thank you, Chair. Just briefly, and it's just the Minister, uh, for just for our attention in relation to the, the mitigations on welfare. Uh, and I know the, the Minister rightly mentioned in questions from Mark the, the challenges that you face in regards to that with a const constantly moving and fluid situation with regards level of payments or other outside factors beyond your own control. And I know there has been some chat uh, from the Minister around maybe wishing to move towards a more indefin indefinite extension. And I think I just wanted to put on, on record my concern uh, in relation to that. I think a, a review mechanism um, would be a better way forward to take into account the, the moving environment that exists. I don't expect you maybe to make comment, but I just wanted to put on record from my own perspective. Thanks. Yeah. No, thanks very much. And I suppose, I mean, all of this is considered. Um, there's aspects of we don't know the full implications for some of the changes, and they need to be assessed and reviewed on an ongoing basis. But when it comes to the issue of the bedroom tax, for example, I can't foresee a situation where that is going to change. Because if we are talking about building communities and building sustainable communities, even if you're talking about 20 years' time, are we ever going to be in a position um, at that point that if um, someone has raised their family, um, their family have moved out and maybe they're near a later point in their life, are we going to force that person to leave that home? Or are we going to force them to pay an additional tax for maybe a room that's not needed? Or if they had a current responsibility and that's not needed? So I think people need to look seriously around what the longer term <coughs> impact, because when we've seen these changes implemented in England, homelessness rose at a stark rate, and so did debt that people had. And what you did have was the breakup of families and communities. So I think when you make chinks or changes, it's the longer term impact. When you looked at England, families in some cases had to leave and live. 30, 40, 50, 60 miles away where there was the next available home. Now we have our own unique circumstances here in that we live in segregated communities in terms of religion and that there's obviously reasons for the legacy of where we've come from and that will need to be addressed over time. It's like the issue of peace walls. The aspiration is there to remove them but they're not going to be done because there are genuine fear factors and you have to move through a process to overcome. So that's not going to be done in five years. It's not going to be done in 10 years. And I don't think any member would ever be in a situation where we want to tax people or force people to leave the home that they have lived in, that they feel secure in, that they have a broader community and family network in, um, in the time ahead. And that's why I did want to move, certainly on the bedroom tax component, um, that there would be no end date um, to that support. 
because I don't think that it's ever going to ever going to change. That's not to say you can't look at solutions in the housing market. That if we do have an aging population, people are going to live differently, um, and you can encourage people to look at all alternative tenancies. But I don't think they should be penalised if they choose not to. Okay. All right, John. Is that you finished? Yep. Yeah. Um, I just want have one more issue because I think everything has almost been covered here today, and that's the issue around the accounts for Sports NI. I mean, that that's remarkable um, that yeah. they haven't um, uh, those haven't been cleared since 1718. Uh, I suppose it's just uh, to ask you, you know, how confident are you um, that they're capable of managing um, uh, to an acceptable standard? Yeah, I know the last couple of accounts in the uh, the the ones that are dated the furthest away have obviously been updated recently. There's been work within the department and officials have been engaging with Sport NI over the last couple of years around issues more generally within the organisation and obviously the knock-on effect that that would have in terms of the accounts. There's obviously been ongoing engagement with the accountant officer within the organisation and my officials, but also with the audit office as well. And obviously we're still waiting on um, a further report coming out um, to look at the implementation and the recommendations that are coming from that. So it is something um, that we are well aware of, that we're concerned about, and obviously on top of to ensure that we do get a resolution. So there's an ongoing engagement to try and get those outstanding accounts accredited. Obviously, as a public body, we need that. And I will be meeting with Sport and I in the time ahead to look at all of these issues to ensure that we do get it on a proper footing, that this isn't repeated um, going forward. I, I, the, I think there is an update. I think we do have the 17, 18. I think, okay. I think the situation is we also we have, uh, they're, they're certified maybe, but not laid. And then the 18, 19, I understand they're either with us or on their way with us. Um, um, also to say that there has been some capability development within Spot and I in terms of uh, recruitment processes. So, um, um, but to, to say you know, as, as a department, we have been, you know basically keeping on top of this and, and trying to make sure that, that we address these issues in the in the longer term. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I'm going to look forward to seeing you again. Yep. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to move on then to item number seven in our packs, which is a briefing by the Deputy Secretary for Housing, Urban Regeneration and Local Government. Um, you'll find that briefing at page 81 of your meeting packs. And can I welcome um, to the table Louise Ward Hunter, Paul Price, and David Polly? You're all very welcome. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Um, uh, Louise, is it yourself that is going to I'll, yeah. kick off? Do you have, uh, Chair, can I just ask, do you all have your little slide packs? Yes, you yes do? we do indeed. Okay, that, that's, that's great. Well, um, you'll recall um, the last time that I was up in front of you with my other colleagues, uh, we did not have sufficient time to have a specific session on housing, so we're back again. And thank you for the invitation to come to talk to you. Um, I, if you don't mind, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk you through um, the, the slide pack that you have in front of you, give you a good overview, and if, at your discretion, Chair, then perhaps we can get into the conversation. Um, may I, first of all, though, properly introduce Paul Price and David Polly. Paul is to my left and David is to my right, and they will be part of answering all of the questions with me um, to, uh, before the um, committee. Um, just to have you understand what both my colleagues do, Paul looks at his responsibility for the oversight um, of the housing executive. So really he is our senior sponsor for the housing executive and also for social housing policy. So that would include, uh, you'll, you'll see as I begin to, as we work across the three of us, when I'm fielding questions, maybe to one or other of them, Paul will talk to maybe some of the issues, if there are further issues that you have on ONS or on new build or on supporting people, those sorts of issues. <coughs> David um, is head of housing supply policy, and that really, in a way, is housing in its widest context. And <coughs> some of the stuff that David will be happy to talk to you about would be around 
private rented sector supported supported housing, uh, specifically in, in, in and around intermediate uh, housing to e.g. co-ownership, homelessness and fuel poverty. So I'm just trying to give you a bit of a flavour as to where each uh, will, will be coming from. Um, I, I hope I won't take too long to talk you through the slide deck um, and if you'd like me to speed up, just give me the nod, uh, So, uh, but I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so, overview in the presentation. This is about giving you a context for housing, including some of the key challenges, what work we've done so far, and obviously the agenda that the new decade, new approach uh, sets, sets out. And then I'll talk a little bit about the key work uh, as we see it to try and deliver on, on the agenda and relate that, of course, to what Minister has already told you this morning uh, where we can. If you turn to uh, the third slide, so the context for us, uh, this the slide sets out some of the headline housing figures that we have in Northern Ireland, and we've got almost 800,000 homes, 790,000 homes in Northern Ireland, and uh, that's about 10% more than the number of houses overall than 10 years ago. And we're currently building around about, uh, not the department of course, but being built in Northern Ireland, about 78,000 houses a year. Looking first at the private rented sector, PRS, on your slide, um, that has doubled in size in the past 10 years. Now larger than the social sector and houses a lot of people who would in the past have been homeowners or who would have been in social housing. And the social rented sector faces um, itself faces, as you know, significant uh, regulatory and financial challenges and uncertainties, with quite severe pressures on the availability of traditional public funding in the short to medium term. The owner-occupier sector also has changed. Average age of a first-time buyer is now early 30s. Uh, age of profile of homeowners more generally has increased, and as a result, more people own houses now outright than with a mortgage, so that bit of that bell curve is moving, as you can imagine, with, the, with, the, with, with age. So what have we done so far? Um, well, this slide looks at some of the significant work that we have been doing in progressing the delivery of public housing over the last decade. I'm not preparing to read that out, just that will give you a very quick snapshot of what we've been doing in terms of the maintenance and in seeking to add vis-a-vis uh, -vis our, our social homes and funding for affordable homes each year. But the big message in there is, despite all of that, housing stress levels show no sign of reducing and need and demand is rising. So if I turn you next, challenges. Um, latest published housing stress figure, which was last March 2019, is around about 26,500, and that's 2,700 more than in 16-17. And as highlighted by a range of research, there are several groups at the income margins who are significantly impacted by housing costs. And one group in particular are the households in lower income who live in private rented accommodation. And in the private in the wider private housing sector, developers continue to face a number of constraints. And uh, we did rehearse that very, very briefly last time I was up, including those linked to land, availability of land finance and infrastructure, and I know we touched very briefly on those um, when we were up last time. We also have an issue of demographics, uh, the ageing population, our number of households is projected to increase by 12% by 2041, partly due to population increase, but also because of the growth of smaller households. And we have an ageing population which brings with it challenges in terms of providing suitable types of housing to meet the needs of this demographic. So um, our two indicators, as you, as you know at the moment, are about issues about in, in the draft programme for government, as well as was the issue around supply and then also the issue around housing stress. And I often see supply as the overarching piece and then housing stress in terms of the fitness and appropriateness of the, of the types of houses that are homes that are available for people. Uh, on to your next slide, so you can see a bit of a graph there, and that's about waiting list. Um, not only is housing stress increasing, but homelessness acceptances have also increased, and that means that approximately 20,000 households on the waiting list are statutorily homeless. And uh, as you know, the housing executive has a statutory duty to make accommodation available for their occupation. So uh, the housing executive and the housing associations make over 7,000 allocations a year, but housing stress itself is continuing to go up. And we've ploughed resources into new social homes, but increasing need is still hampering 
the impact of our efforts. And I, I appreciate some of that you were rehearsing um, with uh, Minister Hardy earlier on. Uh, for example, in the last three years, we've built 5,000 social homes, but over the same time frame, housing stress figures, and that's the red line that you could see, I hope everybody's in colour there, the red line on the above graph, so that's the second line from the, the top, that's increased by almost 3,000. So turning then to new decade, new approach, it has set out a number of priority objectives for the executive in relation to housing, and they've been summarised on this particular slide. So uh, a new PFG outcome uh, uh, with appropriate indicators, enhanced investment in new social home starts. We've already talked about the legislation that you're going to be seeing very soon that in draft vis the, the reclassification of housing associations. The executive will also be examining options, looking, and again, some of this rehearsed before, on historical debt, removal of historical debt and exclusion of the housing executive from corporation tax. Um, a really important piece, again, touched on by committee in your earlier session with Minister around the issue of a long-term trajectory uh, for rental charges, and I think the issue around sustainability in that is a very important bit, and I'm pretty sure the word <coughs> sustainable appeared in the New Decade New Approach document itself. Um, measures also about new legislation vis-a-vis -vis controls to ensure affordability, and then finally enhancing investment, and, and uh, not just targeting new and affordable home starts, but also trying to hit that backlog of, of maintenance. All stuff I appreciate the committee is familiar with. So that, turning next then to delivering and uh, in order to try and meet the challenge, so how is what our current work and, our, and indeed our future work across housing, how uh, will that operate with, within government, working with our partners in government, with voluntary and community and private sectors, how are we actually going to um, tackle these issues and to, to deliver on the, um, the intent and the aspiration set out in New Decade, New Approach. So there are three key strands to that work. And in the next slides, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what those are. So if you turn to your next slide, please, you can see there on supporting existing housing solutions. And I've got three points on, on, on that, which I will summarise quite briefly. Homelessness, supporting people and fuel poverty. If I can turn to homelessness, first of all, uh, as I said before, the housing executive has statutory responsibility for responding to homelessness. Uh, its strategic approach uh, to dealing with it is the current strategy entitled Ending Homelessness Together, the Homelessness Strategy for Northern Ireland 2017-22. to We will continue to fund the housing executive to meet this statutory duty. We also have an interdepartmental action plan, homelessness action plan, uh, that will focus on trying to address the gaps in non-accommodation services beyond the remit of the housing executive. It's a rolling plan uh, evolving over the five years of the homelessness strategy and a report on year two and an action plan for year three are due to be published in June this year. Most recently, under its homelessness strategy, the housing executive has developed a chronic homelessness action plan, CHAP for short with actions aimed at aiding the approximately 10% the known homeless population who are in a cycle of repeat homelessness. And we're also looking at other schemes and interventions that are being used elsewhere to tackle homelessness. So again, as the Minister said, not looking constantly looking inwards, but trying to look outwards to, to learn from best practice, because as we know, homelessness uh, is a pernicious issue and very, very difficult to, 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 ta to tackle. If I can turn briefly to supporting people, um, I'm sure members of the committee will be very familiar with that programme. 72.8 million in value, doing our very best once the Minister sees what her, what her intentions are, what her allocation is and budget, but that is, we've sought to maintain that over past, past years. So, I, uh, uh, of course, will be within the gift of Minister once she gets her full budget allocation, how she handles that. But it's a lifeline for our most vulnerable people, including homeless people, older people and people with disability. <coughs> And um, very important in terms of the programme and the services delivered by it, uh, and by such a range of housing providers as well, with loads of partners helping us do this. That's underlined by the fact that the department's decision to maintain its budget, in contrast to other reductions that we've had over time, um, that it, we have maintained that. Um, but uh, it'll be challenging to try and see can we push that budget uh, 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 outline of 72.8 
million further. Um, and so I think for us, we must look at what the recommendation when we did the review of supporting people some years ago, and there were a number of recommendations around how could we improve the efficiency of that and the effectiveness of the programme. And I think that that remains a very important uh, uh, not just an effort on behalf, of course, of DFC, but of working with the housing executive and clearly of working um, with the partner organisations to help us deliver it, because we know we have to do deliver the best po possible value for these very vulnerable um, um, people to sustain their ability to live in their own um, homes success successfully or, or sustain, sustain tenancies. And we have to do it in a way that does deliver value for money too, uh, and that's a, I think that's a very serious issue for us. Fuel poverty. Uh, affordable warm scheme is the department's main scheme for tackling fuel poverty, and it's delivered by the councils and the housing executive. As members know, scheme targets the most vulnerable in need of support and offers a range of heating and insulation measures to improve the energy efficiency of home. And I, I appreciate that you've already touched on that briefly with the minister. Um, but just a, a few facts about it: the scheme was introduced in April 2015. More than 73 million has been invested to improve the energy efficiency of over 17 and a half thousand homes, and we are in the business, as you heard earlier, of preparing a new strategy, meeting a range of stakeholders, and we are preparing a document um, for public consultation, which of course must go to Minister first for her approval, and we will bring that forward to committee in advance of any proposed public consultation. So work is underway on that. Um, we are. Chair, are you all right if I keep going at pace? Go ahead. Is that all right? Uh, increasing the number of allocations. Um, quite a few things on this slide. Uh, you know that we have a big programme uh, in relation to social housing uh, provision over the last decade. It's been very important that not only is every effort made, but that we are, we are trying to sustain this provision and uh, maintain it and enhance it. And in, you heard from the Minister earlier on, in line with the new decade, new approach, the uh, Minister wants to bring forward the o ONS um, reclassification of housing associations and the legislation around that as quickly as possible. Um, and, and again, I appreciate members are familiar. What that will enable us to do is to make sure that uh, that reversal will um, prevent the housing, ex uh, the, the executive, sorry, Mixing up my executives, the executive itself having to cover 100% of the cost of new social homes, and as you know, um, which are built through the housing associations through the capital budget. So uh, the executive uh, currently covers around about 54% of the, of the cost, and so that reversal will, of course, protect our supply of affordable homes. Um, you are, you have heard. On a number of occasions already, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive Landlord Investment Challenge. Um, our biggest social landlord, stock of 86,000 homes, two thirds of all social homes here, and one in nine approximately of the entire housing stock across Northern Ireland. You appreciate, the Minister has already stated, houses are under, homes are under threat uh, based on an exhaustive uh, physical examination of 23,000 of those homes. The housing executive has advised that they are deteriorating and generating a big backlog of work. Um, the figures, as Minister said, three billion required over the next 11 years, um, uh, 7.1 billion over 30 years, but front-loaded because of the backlog issues on, on, on maintenance. So some potential solutions were outlined in NDNA. Um, uh, and again, you are familiar with those, but that's around removing historical debt, excluding housing executive from having to pay corporation tax, and setting the long-term trajectory uh, for its rents, for the housing executive's rents, in a way that is sustainable and affordable to, to tenants. But we also want to look at, and colleagues will talk about this uh, a little bit, we will, we will want to examine other ways that we can try and identify how best we can ensure that we can secure the large uh, capital investment that is required, and that will not be without its challenges. Increasing the number of allocations onto your next slide. Um, so, a few key bullet points there. And uh, so, in 1920, 146 million of capital funding was allocated to the Social Housing Development Programme to deliver 1,850 homes. That's the sort of target number that we've had. Uh, the NDNA uh, commitment is to increase this and assist in uh, and any plan, I think, to turn the curve on, on housing stress 
has to major on increasing the supply of, of new social housing, and the Minister has already reinforced that this morning. But that's going to mean more capital dial from the, house, from the executive to increase the rate of new social build, a more joined up and effective <coughs> approach to securing land for social housing, and of course back to the infrastructure issue again around the water and the sewage network to increase capacity. And we also have to invest uh, opportunities within DSE to develop closer working relationships with a wide range of delivery um, partners. If I was to refer back to the little graph on, on housing stress, I mean, that uh, illustrated that increasing social housing loan wouldn't be enough to turn the, you know, uh, the, the curve on housing stress. So we are going to need to look at other options across all sectors. And, and you heard what I said earlier on about actually the size of the private rented sector as well. You know what, 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 the, what how, how, how that is to as well as um, affordable uh, ownership and uh, and also um, private ownership. So. Uh, Few more, just a few more slides, um, providing better options then through wider housing market. We want to be able to complement uh, our efforts to deliver more social homes by expanding the range of intermediate or affordable housing options available to those whose current housing situation doesn't suit their needs, but who currently have very limited options open to them as to what they can actually do. So the review of the definition of affordable housing is essential to provide us with the policy framework to try and develop this broader range of options and officials are currently considering the comments from uh, our, our consultees and any change to a proposed new definition will be tested with relevant stakeholders. One new product we are currently researching is affordable rent or intermediate rent and there are, these are products for those who cannot afford ownership but who might be able to pay more than social rents. And we will also want to maximise the potential for newer funding streams such as FTC, financial transactions, capital loan funding, to deliver some of these additional housing options. And so I note that in the recent spring supplementary estimates, Northern Ireland returned 150 million of unused FTC. So we recognise that that clearly is an opportunity missed and that is something that that this department is very exercised in being able to play its part in seeking to address, and I know you will appreciate um, our Minister's view on that. So other actions include the public land for housing. We're on track to release six sites by the end of March 2021, and we also want to review our empty homes strategy as well. Um, so um, on to my last, um, my penultimate slide. Uh, Delivery against our, our PFG targets are also about making best use of what we have, our current stock as it is. That also means, as I alluded to earlier, about trying to make better use of our private rented stock. As I said earlier, many more people living uh, there than previously. Many of them would before now would have owned their own homes or lived in social housing. And as the Minister referred to, there are now twice as many children living in private rented sector houses as in social homes. And about half the people in the in the PRS sector receive housing benefit or uh, UC housing cost element. And there have been a series of changes to benefit and type, which now means that around 85% of them have to top up their benefit from other income. So uh, you, I appreciate uh, you may already be familiar with some of that, but just to restate uh, to a useful recap. Under changes to local housing allowance, the LHA freeze and under 35 single, um, single room payments, the, 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 there are changes involved in that which relate to, to uh, that, what is impacting there. So unlike welfare reforms for social tenants such as the bedroom tax, these were not mitigated and research has been carried out that demonstrates in many areas there's very little housing available within the LHA rate. Uh, households have to top up their rent, often from other benefits, and there can be no doubt that this is increasing poverty, housing stress, and demand for social housing. Um, and in 2017, the department carried out a consultation on proposals for change for the private rented sector. Responses were analysed. Some of these were taken forward operationally. One of the proposals which has been taken forward was the establishment of a dedicated landlord helpline, and we're also piloting a mediation <coughs> service. Um, given that three years has passed, or have passed rather, since these, this particular consultation, we are reviewing the recommendation to ensure that that they're still valid, the that the recommendations were still valid, and that, subject to our minister's agreement, we could then be consulting on our findings in the near future. So our aim is to ensure that the private rented sector is 
as good a housing option as possible for those who need it. And that's in parallel with our work to increasing housing options by expanding our social intermediate affordable housing provision. So in conclusion, uh, my final slide there, summary of our key actions. These are the big ticket items for us. ONS reclassification reversal, enhancing social housing development, securing the future of the housing executive, and you heard Minister speak about her reflections on that and her, about her, 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 her desire to see a, re a revitalisation of the housing executive, the development of additional affordable housing solutions, and I've touched at pace, I appreciate, on what some of those might look like, um, a commitment to trying to improve the private rented sector and then looking at housing um, support initiatives. And I think that, in a way, comprises the potential housing programme that, that we have. We know that these are the big ticket items. They all hang together. They, they, uh, if you're trying to look at housing and, and, the, and the challenges we have uh, over the next, um, uh, well, in seeking to drive a, a, a housing programme forward over the next two years of the mandate, these are core elements within that. Um, plan also represents, I think, a way of trying to provide that holistic, um, that holistic um, viewpoint and to try and target support to those in greatest need, which the um, Minister has already gone on record as her stated, a, a, a part of her stated objective in her approach to the role that she has as Minister for Department for Communities. So we also want to consider how we will improve a strategic framework which will link these key actions and longer term interventions to turn the curve. <coughs> On housing stress. So um, I do appreciate, Chair and uh, Deputy Chair and uh, members, that has been a huge amount to canter through. Um, but in a way, I think that paints a very, uh, uh, the best picture I can anyway at this stage of trying to say, look at the range of things that we are dealing with. And uh, I, we are very happy at your discretion to take questions. And as I say, I'll I may not be able to answer all of them in the, in the detail you will need, so I'm very grateful that I have David and Paul here to help me on that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That was certainly glad we got you back for a separate session. I don't think we would have fit all this in the last time. Yeah. And I know there will be plenty of uh, people around the table wanting to ask questions. Um, I've just got a few things before I open it up. Um, one of those is, it, it, you heard us ask earlier, the Minister, in about the private rented sector, and I'm glad David's here as well. Um, with you, who who's, has that responsibility, and you would said there, you know, as good an option as possible. And we know for many years to come, the private rented sector um, will be utilised greatly um, for uh, as a use for social housing, because we're not going to have those houses built um, anytime soon to, to cover that. It's just the regulations again. We brought them up with the minister, um, whether that is secure tenancies, whether that is fit. For you know, houses that are fit for habitation and in many cases as well. And it's just going into the future, it is going to be years before that whole before the social housing sector is big enough um to cope. Um going into the future, what when are those you know, when are we going to regulate for all of those things to pr provide people that security living in those homes? Um just in a very brief opening comment and then if you don't mind David I'll uh, I'll I'll pass you I, I think that we are, are seeking um, at pace with the return of the executive and given all the statements that have been put made in, um, uh, in uh, NDNA, it, that we, we, we are going to try and start on a journey across a range of fronts. And some of that, I have to be honest with you, is we have to look at the, the resourcing team that we have and, the, and, and how we set up some of those priorities. So I, I, I suppose in a way what, I, what I'm trying to say is that while we will want to make a, a, a really concerted start on many of these, we recognise that the pace and phasing may also be shaped by the, the nature of the, what will become different priorities as, as we go along. So just that's a bit of, about the, but we're trying to lay that foundation stone. David, is there anything that you'd like to answer um, specifically on regulations? Yes. As you know, we have tenancy deposit protection and we have a landlord registration scheme, um, which is run by the department. We had agreed that we would talk to councils about transferring that to councils. I'm um, sure they'll be delighted to hear that. Um, well, it comes with income. Okay, well then it might be all right. Um, <laughs> and this is following on from a transfer of HMO licensing yeah. to councils. And we have had initial meetings with Solace about that. Um, we keep a list of, la of landlords and 
a register and we use that to support the sector but it isn't really used at the minute for some of those things that you mentioned um, around because it's kept by the department yeah. and some of those functions sit back with the department with councils in terms of actually going out and seeing whether or not things are houses are sufficient quality to fit things like that it would fit better alongside the functions that councils have councils when we had that initial meeting said well we would like to do it but we don't want you just to give us a list um, one advantage as well is it counts as active enforcement powers yeah. and we suspect that about a third of private rented sector houses aren't on our list and we actually have no enforcement powers but councils have enforcement powers they don't have the list so we thought it would be better fit with councils for those reasons and that initial discussion council said that they were open to looking at it but if they did that they would want to take it a step further they'd want for example before a house was put on the list they'd want to go out and check it to make sure it was sufficient quality it was not unfit. Um, so we are starting those discussions with them. The Minister alluded we actually spent an hour and a half with her yesterday talking about the private rented sector and where we were going to go with it. As Louise said, a lot has changed. I mean, our proposals around the private rented sector sort of had their origin five or six years ago. If you think about what's happened in other places and here, the private rented sector has changed a lot. Um, we have um, landlord which, uh, we have letting agent um, regulation, for example, being suggested in London. We have issues around um, the EPC or the insulation of houses are being taken forward and are much more strenuous in England, Wales and in Scotland than our proposals everywhere here and this sort of aligns with the climate emergency and things like that. So there's discussions that we're having with the Minister about what we can do and how we can do it and how quickly we can do it. But yes, that, I mean, that was our intention was to transfer to councils even when we didn't have ministers. We thought we could do that. But now that we have a minister and we have politicians, the councils have said they're a bit more ambitious about that and they're looking to ex um, extend that discussion as to how they could make that a better process that would drive improvement in the sector. Uh, and I, I suppose as a constituency MLA, I know certainly in my, in my part of North Belfast, 70% of, of, I'd say, of my caseload is housing, um, you know, which I know is probably extremely high compared to some other areas, but that's just the way it is in North Belfast. Um, and you know, when we talk about fuel poverty, and um, the various other issues that we want to that we want to look at seriously, and we want to uh, to combat those. If we look at our housing and the state of some of our housing, and I know certainly in my own area, when it comes to insulation, when it comes to, so I can't even say that the private rented sector is any worse than what our own uh, housing executive. Uh, uh, properties are like as well. So I think when we look at all of those issues in the round, we have to look at it holistically, and the effects on people's lives. Because if we're, you know, if we we can't we can't come down hard on private rental landlords when we look at our own at the housing mm -hmm. executive and some of the stock they have as well. Um, uh, and certainly, um, I think there's much improvement needs done there. Can I just go on then to actually the, the you're supporting people. You brought it up as well, and. Um, the supporting people we know, and I know because I sat in DSD for a number of years as well, was ring fenced over the years by uh, previous ministers, which was great, and uh, and I would hope that that continues into the future. But ring fencing it has been at a loss um, to those those many groups out there, and those many groups out there through supporting people are combating tackling homelessness. Um, so we can't deal with one without the other, and again, that's another one that needs to be looked at holistically. And um, I, I would hope at some stage we will get a, a briefing on supporting people and how that uh, and what's being done on that. But I know um, from you know over the last few years, hearing from various um, groups that the supporting people and without that and without the increase over the years has caused them great problems as well. Um, I appreciate that. That uh, I, I know certainly that many of the providers uh, uh, who are partners um, with us in the supporting um, people program uh, certainly have raised that and, and have raised that with the housing executive and, and, and have raised with us. And, and I appreciate that 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 has been a balancing act for previous. Ministers to to take into account against uh, against all of the other pressures, and I do appreciate the point that you make, Chair, about the connectedness it has to many other of the very challenging issues uh, uh, um, around there. Um, just something that I wouldn't necessarily have said, but just to give you a wee bit of an understanding. But, um, but in terms of the of driving the the program and the effectiveness of the program, I 
chair uh, a supporting people program board within the department okay. uh, our, our, our colleague Clark Bailey chief executive of the housing executive and some of his senior staff um, sit on that they're part of that we have other um, colleagues from other related departments sit on it too and, uh, and, and of course my m m colleagues um, within the department and part of what we've been trying to do on that ever since I joined the department um, almost three years ago now is about making it's about continuing that drive about saying that if if, if we are within this envelope and and even if that envelope were ever to increase the issue has to be around the, the improving the quality of the of, of the delivery by 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 targeting it where it is uh, what is needed needed most and that takes us into um, issues around the recommendation around the needs assessment that came out of the review so that we actually had an evidential base on which to be able to effectively target the, and program um, the orientation of the money. So that's not to say that the, those themes, those key themes in there, which, which you'd be familiar with, um, would, would necessarily change. But it is about the orientation and the best application of the package and then the best way possible. But possibly, Paul, would you like to say a word or two in response? I mean, Louise has covered it, really. The, the budget has been £72.8 million for a number of years as a proportion of the department's total revenue budget allocation each year, that has been going up. So all other budgets have been reduced. Protection has meant a 72.8 million when it's flat cash to every provider. There's a bigger and bigger commitment proportionally the department is making to this programme every <coughs> year. It will be, if that resource, overall resource picture doesn't change, it's difficult to see there's very difficult choices required by the department to, to redirect more funds into SP, so it becomes increasingly important for the, our department to try and make sure that the existing pot gets spent as well as possible, and implementing the various recommendations from the, continuing to implement the various recommendations from the review of 2015, which are about making the programme and its disbursement of funding based on solid evidence, about being making sure that payment rates were standardised and not... Um, arbitrarily anomalous. Um, it's about getting those things through to make sure at least while we cannot put the budget up, we can make sure it's spent as well as possible. Okay. I, I mean, I suppose I'd just say again, my only worry is, with, especially around the supporting people, is the knock-on effect it has. Yeah. You know, if it, if it isn't supported, yeah. um, it, it has a knock-on effect across, across the board on that. And I see Mark is waving here to come in. But I, I also know that... Um, waving the advice. I know. <laughs> I also I, I know it was this it was the, the old DSD committee as it was way back when that lobbied those ministers over the years <coughs> this committee that I mean we'd had so many briefings on this over the years that we you know that we felt the import we knew the importance of it from people actually coming in to give us witness sessions people who had used the service as well and the importance and the difference that it made in their lives and it is one of those tangible um, you know. Uh, 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 projects or whatever you want. It is something that we can see and we can see as constituency MLAs is making a big difference to people's lives. I think there's, I mean, I certainly would have a passion about it and um, I do think and I it's... Understand. When I first joined the, the department, the, I think it was nearly the very first um, housing association I went to, I think it was Triangle Housing, was um, was, was invited into the home of um, a, a, a woman with a, with a brain injury and how, of course, she was receiving her support in, in that accommodation was through supporting people. So it was. It, yeah. I appreciate that. Mark, you want to make a very brief point? Uh, it was just on this. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that. Man. Uh, I, I recognise, I suppose, the impact on wider services across the department by ring fencing. Uh, one element, but uh, I'd be, like to be associated with the Chair's comments around uh, supporting people. Uh, is there a way that you have tracked or looked at the demand on this programme over, over those same years? So, when, in terms of percentages or, or proportionally, supporting people's budget has increased. But what about the demand on the programme? Uh, how, how much has it increased in the same time period? Well, the, the, because it's had, broadly speaking, because it had a flat cash scenario, it has, in, it has been able to maintain only the existing or pre-existing level of operations. So you have the same number of schemes operated by the same number of providers. So in that period, if demand has grown, which it has, then there is unmet demand. I mean, there has been no, there has been no new supported accommodation, for instance, delivered to the SP programme through the new build programme because, or at least very little of it recently, because of the additional revenue pressure it would unfunded place upon the supporting people programme budget. I mean, this is really, really difficult. I mean, your, your point, Chair, that, that the priority 
and the sort of importance of this programme is understood by the department as well. I mean, the protection of the budget, whilst it looks like flat cash to everybody else, I say it again, that is the department prioritising it away that, above every other resource pressure to the extent that it can. And, and that does mean that it has been able mainly to continue to, pre to do what it did before and not increase the level of service in relation to demand. Not increase the level of service or the level of pay, I suppose. That th th those workers you get, many of whom are actually now getting less than the vulnerable people that they're supporting. Yes. Now, that, that, that will also be a matter for they, they receive their envelope. There is a question then of what they, of their, them as an employer deciding what to do with yeah. it. And um, um, so there is, there is that involved in there too. Okay. You want to make yeah, a quick point on this as well? And then I'm not bringing these in again on quick points. I can come back to it. it was your previous point that you'd mentioned to, to David just in relation to the, the private rented sector. I was very interested in, in what you said in relation to the councils taking on or, or that conversation ongoing. Biggest concern probably would be is the resource adequate to deal with the, the challenges that it faces? Is there any, um, I suppose probably not now, but is there any indications of potential financial package needed? Uh, and uh, are councils and, and the department in two very different places in regards to that? Um, we're not that far ahead with the conversation, but um, essentially a landlord pays to get on to the landlord yeah. registration scheme. At the minute that money comes to the department and we use that to pay for the scheme and to fund a few things to support landlords through that scheme, like training, um, the landlord helpline and the pilot medi mediation service and things like that, as well as to pay for the staffing of the scheme. Um, once we decided what we were going to transfer out to the councils and what they would have to do, we would have a discussion and do some research about what it would cost them and then we would then decide what a reasonable fee would be for landlords, and that's how we did it with the HMO transfer. We got a report done, and you know we are giving extra duties to the council. This is what it costs. Therefore, to cover that, the fee to license as an HMO will be this, and we agreed that with the councils. And on that basis, we all agreed to go ahead. Thanks, sir. Just and then just another couple of points I want to make. The other is about the the. the functions of the housing executive going forward um, and we all know and we understand that that has to change it absolutely does and they need to have the ability um, whatever that may look like going forward to, to borrow um, do you see that being something similar to the model um, that the councils use or do you see that um, you, you know because if we I know it's been said we want to keep it within the public sector um, but borrowing within the public sector is not uh, as easy either. It's just how, we, how do you see we go forward with, with those well, functions? I mean, there, there would be a number, potentially a number of models um, to um, to examine how the housing executive could forward and, and, and as the Minister uses the language of revitalisation. So I think it is in terms of being fit for purpose to, to uh, particularly enable it uh, to, to address that. I mean, one aspect would be about uh, and I, and I think it's, it is interesting this issue about the classification because the reclassification of our housing associations are are into the private sector. Well, we know that they're all voluntary sector organisations, they're all charitable trusts, uh, you know, companies limited by guarantee um, with charitable status. I mean, they're, they're one model might be to have a, almost a, 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 a remodelling which would suggest that type of model. So you'd have, a, in, a, in a way, a, a, um, um, a different classification or different status for it, which would be more akin to what you're seeing in the other, um, w w in terms of the housing associations. But on the on the bit on the nuance around uh, around enabling to, to borrow in a different way, uh, the way councils do, I'm less expert on that one. I might ask Paul to lift that one up. The um, um Broadly speaking, a council can borrow without our, one of our councils can borrow, and the council across the UK can borrow without its borrowing scoring against central government's mm -hmm. public expenditure, um, because of the because there is no control by central government over, or there isn't sufficient control by central government over that local authority for that link to be there. It goes back to the ONS issue and, and the issue of how central government controls a body that borrows money. Um, it's difficult to, we have yet to find really a, a public sector entity other than a council that has that freedom. Um, so, um, short of returning housing functions to councils, <laughs> it's difficult to see how, how we get that borrowing freedom in relation to housing. Um, it's um, unless we can find a different kind of public sector model. And then, so therefore, you go into these 
um, these, these models that sort of move just beyond the public sector uh, into the sort of territory of social enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, and where you uh, maybe, but these are all options to be discussed no, I get that, yeah. the departmental policy to be established. The other way of funding That's the Housing good. Executive Investment Challenge is to the executive to put capital down into the housing executive while it remains in the public sector. That's cool. Yeah, Excuse me. Sorry, Kelly, you'd want to... So I was just going to say, that's how NIFCO works, that's how TransLink works. It's owned by us, yeah. but it operates commercially. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, it's open, open up to other departments, it's being done elsewhere. But fundamentally, if its borrowings are not to score against our public expenditure, mm -hmm. our control of it cannot be consistent with it being a public sector body. But it wouldn't be public sector in the fact that we would own it. I would need to maybe tease out quite what ownership yeah. means in that respect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I think yeah. I, I don't want to open a, an yeah. entire debate Sorry. on this because I do think we will have this going forward. We'll have many debates on this as to the direction of I, I travel. If I, if I may, one one thing that I would say, and certainly when um, the issue of uh, transfer of stock, you know, when we pretenders were tested on that, and, and we had a number of. Uh, Attempts to you know open that open that up and, and tenants said no thank you they didn't want to they wanted to stay with the housing executive they didn't want to go over to housing association and the reason why I raise that is that the issue I think very importantly the issue of the brand of the housing executive is really really important to the people who live in housing executive homes who are who who are tenants and I, I think that they're that. Uh, in any of the preliminary discussions that I've been having um, with the housing executive and with colleagues as we begin to try and shape up these options to bring forward to the minister for her consideration, one of the things that I'm acutely aware of is the meaning of the housing executive the, as a brand and, it's, it, and it is very meaningful and so as we proceed sensitively and thoughtfully forward, that, that issue of what it means to people who really want to stay with the housing executive to my mind, denotes something about evolve, you know, evolution, evolving it to be able to meet and play its part in meeting some of these big needs ahead. So, just wanted to. No, and I'm sure we will have wider debate on this as we yeah. go forward. You know, and thank you yeah, for answering those you. questions on that. I just have one more thing, and I'm kind of kind of bringing it back to all politics is local now. Um, I, I, as a representative for North Belfast, when we see figures constantly, or we see things in the press, and there's even we have a press cutting in our packs today. Um, everybody has this belief that North Belfast stops on the Whitewell Road, and uh, but it doesn't. It continues into Newton Abbey, and the figures for Newton Abbey are never included when we talk about North Bel Belfast. That's just a gripe I have. That's not your fault. It's a gripe that I have. Um, but when we talk about um, the North Belfast in general, we have the tar block strategy yes. uh, within Nor North Belfast which is more so, I suppose, than most other areas. I think we have the most tar blocks. So we do, and I know in the original plans it was, um, I know certainly for, for some of the tar blocks in North Belfast, it was uh, looking at um, finding someone to, to take over as the uh, landlord. Um, certainly that was the plan for Rush Park. And then other plans were for Rathkill for, for demolition. Yeah. Um, I just supposed to say uh, if you're aware of, of the progress that has been made on any of those issues, because um, the, it, it appears to be very little consultation or very little conversation has taken place over that across the board with tar blocks from what we're hearing back. Well, I know Andy has asked a number of questions yes, uh, I seen that. Around, around this and that, and that you would have seen. I mean, the housing executive. Ha it, has undertaken yeah, it pretty pretty strong and uh, and extensive. Thank you, uh, David. Extensive. So just a just a quick recap there. Uh, strategy was approved by their, their their board back in September 15. Um, the action plan was delayed while it's, a decision was going to be taken. Uh, clearly, off that terrible tragedy at at, at Grenfell. Um, uh, so there was a the, the important piece around the investigation around post Grenfell to assure tenants that the, the tower blocks were, were safe. The action plan was then agreed by the Housing Executive Board in May 2018, and at that time they uh, uh, and that was the basis on which they were consulting with stakeholders. I know that I attended events where political representatives were invited in to the Housing Executive. Uh, so they consulted between June and December 2018. And they had a number of briefings, and I know you're, you're nodding there, Chairs, the 19th of June, 28th exactly. of June. We were there at both sessions, and uh, the, uh, the final tower block action plan was approved back last March by the executive, Housing Executive Board. A strategic outline business case was approved by DFC 
in August of, of last year, and a finance DOF approval has been um, uh, received. So Monk's, Monk's, Monk's Cool House is the first tower block for demolition. This case was received just before Christmas, 6th of December. Approval was, for demolition was given by DFC on the 10th of January. And uh, we have more, and this is in response to your questions, uh, Andy, that, that we're now doing. They're doing individual business cases per um, per uh, block or or blocks as 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 appropriate. And sorry, I'm just. I, I know I have attended about... many of those meetings. Yes. I have been to many yes. of those meetings, and absolutely, and I don't want to bring this all no. down to local again. Um, and I've attended many of the residents' meetings also. Um, and uh, and I know Monk School has been land empty for many many years, and to get that back into any fit uh, uh, would be yeah billions of pounds. Yeah. Um, but it's it, it's those other other residents and the, the the uncertainty that lies ahead. And I mean, I also know because I've been part of it. We've had infestations in our tower blocks as well, which have had to be have to been addressed. I mean, there's various issues and various problems there. Albeit people are very happy living within within those as well. Um, so it's just for for further. Uh, uh, and I know I, I've been meeting again with the chief executive on the issue um, of the tower blocks. Um, but it, I suppose it's it's. There's lots of stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, Chair, if I, if I may, I mean, I think that's one of the things that we will take. I mean, as you know, we speak very regularly. Paul, as our senior sponsor for the Housing Executive, speaks very regularly. I'll be meeting the Chair but, um, before long in the next couple of weeks. And I know it's not just North Belfast. No, it's, but we'll bring, we bring, we bring, we bring that back. I mean, I think if one of the points I'm picking you up correctly on is the I mean, the way you can never have too much communication is if 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 it's if if your um, constituents mm -hmm. and others are, uh, uh, aren't perhaps um, hearing what's under thoughts. And I understand some of the reason is because of the the times the time scales as we go along. I mean, there's maybe been a year between um, you know a consultation and, a, and then the decision or whatever that might be or. You know, and I know that causes issues. It's just to highlight it. That's all. Well, thank you. Can I just help uh, the um the new lodge tower blocks. I mean, yeah. the, the, the tower block strategy. I don't know a great deal about the new lodge tower blocks. I have to say, but they are included in the North Belfast. They are. Indeed, yes. Um, but, well, it's um, the important thing. The, the strategy really divides all three, 33 tower blocks up into three phases, and according to how needed they are, and according to how acute the investment need is, and uh, and so and that's published and available. So it's very. Yeah. It, you can see what's planned for the tower block in the area you're concerned with. The overarching picture for this is the investment challenge and the. Um, the work that these tower blocks require. They are the, sharp, the very sharpest end of the backlog and the, and the massive investment liability. Um, essentially, um, it, we can't, the housing executive really cannot mount a case for keeping these in the long term. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on a point of there too, and I'll stop it after this. I mean, even we look at the Rush Park tower blocks where we have people that can't go out, outside onto their which have lovely balconies overlooking the lock, they're beautiful, but because they're, they, they're unsafe, yeah. You know, and windows that are unsafe. You know, and I, I do, I get that. I understand that absolutely. Right, that's going to finish me for now. I do have more questions, but I can't come back. I have Emma Kelly, Mark, and then Robin. So Emma, thank you, Chair, and thanks to you all for your presentation. Um, just I'm going through the um, slides here for where you refer to the number of um, new builds. Yep. So. 1,500 new social homes per year. What's the figure for homes per year sold off through right to buy? Um, Paul, it knows that. It varies according to how the market last year was about 400, comprising mm. 50 unsold from housing associations, about 350 from housing executives. So, technically speaking, taking that into account, I mean, last year then there would have been less than 1,200. Yeah, well, that 1,500 figure is broad, and that's a reference to completions. In, in recent years, we've been starting the building of, uh, you know, last year we managed 1,786 new, new social building starts. This year we're in for 1,850. The year before that it was 1,600. The rate at which those yeah. starts become completion generates that figure, and that's a that's a but round. The net would be considerably yeah. lower. Yeah. Then so, so you, if the output of the of your average new build year is around about 1800 as a start so then when those completed they are being offset by in terms of total supply by sales absolutely true yeah. 
So maybe a more accurate figure then would take that into consideration. Like we can produce for you, there's, there's numerous definitions of what a completion is and what a start is. Different authorities do it differently, but we can produce for you an account that shows no, it, the churn. Just, just because obviously, in spite of this housing stress levels, from being reduced, and the reason obviously the rate today is is an input into that or a factor. Um, the the other thing then was taken. And I think it's the second point, the delivering to meet the challenges, providing better options through the wider housing market. Is it the case then, and Kelly touched on this, or sorry, not Kelly, Paula touched on this with the, the reference to the private rentals and some of the issues there in terms of the, the standard of housing. And we've made reference to some of the regulations, but the regulations in the north wouldn't probably be as strong as across the rest of these islands. Um, is it the case that someone who's in housing distress who isn't getting a, a house through the housing executive because of the waiting lists and the, the high point requirements and all of that, are, are they then being advised into the private rental sector? Sector, do you want to lift that one, David? I, I'm not necessarily sure that they're being advised as such, but yeah. perhaps you want to address that? I mean, everyone who's on the list is already somewhere. Um, and many of them, mm. as you know, when you look at the breakdown of why they're in housing stress. Um, a chunk of them are because of relationship breakups. About 17% are because of loss of tenancy in the private rented sector. This is um, homelessness declarations. And then there's some in accommodation not suitable, and they're broken down by overcrowding and things. So quite often they're in social housing. They can already be in social housing or another type of housing. Or um, some of them are older people whose accommodation is not suitable because they um, have had some sort of health event. And they need a different type I'm just of coming from the perspective of I know that people that approach me for help, and when you contact the, the local patch manager or the, the housing manager in the area, what they'll say is, look, that person currently has 160 points. They're not likely to increase. Yeah, so in the housing executives, housing solutions we, service. We we have yeah. what they what they say to me is that look, you know, the average requirement in that area. At the minute, is at 180 points. I've only got X number of, of properties available. They're not going to get a house in the, in the in the near future. The likelihood is, I would advise them to to look about a private rental, and then you, that's the yeah. person yeah. they left. Well, to they will be advising them of the fact that there is no other option yeah. in that area because of the imbalance of demand and supply. The housing executive has introduced the housing options mm -hmm. service and they could tell you in more detail about it but the, the point of that was to move away from just putting someone through a point in exercise and then not telling them it to helping them find a house and having an honest conversation with them and part of that I said if that is the only areas that you're prepared to look at and this is the points that you have you are likely to wait possibly quite a long time so you will need to either look at the area a different type of housing solution or, or the private rental sector. That's grand, thank the you. Important point there, sorry to take us off, but it, we are of course looking at how the waiting list, our review of allocations is looking at how the waiting list operates, at least try and in part make it a better response to housing need than it currently is. But this is something that again is Okay. Okay, Kelly. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> you, you know, we're getting all everybody's name mixed up today now. Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm going to start off by asking something that actually ties in really closely to Emma. I was quite surprised when you said that if somebody's on the waiting list, they're already somewhere. That's not true. Um, I have young men who present in my office who are looking for houses and their points aren't enough. They should be on the list, but they're being knocked off the list because of the excuses. We don't have appropriate, you know, so they are forced to go to the private sector. Um, the list isn't right, so I'm going to ask you what is happening with that selection scheme? Because it is, it is forcing people into homelessness. And if you've got this programme of ending homelessness together, catch yourselves on. There are people, there are young men, there is no gender proofing happening here. There are young men in their droves not qualifying for houses because that selection scheme deliberately discriminates against them. Um, into, um, the, Far ahead on the allocation scheme. I think the, the what we're doing. I mean, it's true that the people on the waiting list are not in a social home. I think that's the that's the the, the point where by my. They're in their thinking. cars in my but, area. But indeed, so I mean, that, that's not. I don't think we meant to at all elide that point. The um um, <coughs> they they they. You know, they they have a housing solution currently, and it's probably not the right. It may well not be the right one. We are, are, we've conducted our review, it has 
proposed 20 changes to the selection scheme to try and make it doesn't obviously a review of how points work can't add one home to total supply but it can try and make the waiting list a better way of responding to housing need and fairer We've consulted on this, uh, we have prepared a report on the consultation. A lot of the decisions that would change the nature of the waiting list are quite big decisions. Uh, they're with our Minister. Um, and so the way forward is going to be established soon. Okay. But um, um, some of the changes that were consulted on, I don't know if you, were, if you can remember the consultation, but it's about things about making time spent on the list. One of the factors that actually contributes to your points, um, look at intimidation points, Things like that. So, really, quite significant proposals that will that would change the, the way the list operates. Well, I'll come. I'll come to that now. Um, yeah, one thing. Sorry. sorry. I mean, you said if people are sending their cars, the housing executive has a statutory duty. Mm. Yes, it does. A yeah. place for the night. So, if somebody genuinely comes into the housing executive office, they will be assessed for full duty applicant and homelessness. Except and for it depends the time that they come to the office and that because could be, the office close. That could be a hostel. Well, they've taken over the out of our, our service as well, as you know. Yeah. Uh, so that could be a hostel. It could be a short term uh, let. A hostel in Ballymena for somebody from Newton Arts. Could be yeah. somewhere. Yes. Yeah. So it's never. It's not always going to be ideal, and there's all sorts of constraints about that. Okay. Um, I have an issue at the moment, and it is local, but it will apply elsewhere. I'm concerned that the housing executive is creating a market for itself for the future, knowing that there's going to be a change. I have developers in my local area who are looking to build houses, social houses, but they're being told by the housing executive, we don't need any more. The waiting list in my area is huge. But they're being told, no, no, we don't need any social housing in this area. We're, we've got enough. Um, and I'm looking at it going, that is rubbish. They, they obviously don't get it, as many people through their doors as I get through my constituency office, because the number of people in housing stress who are in the wrong houses, like I had one with a grandfather, two daughters, and six children in a two-bedroom house. Um, you know, so I'm just wondering, is there any controls being put, or an overview being put on the allocation of where houses are? Um, because if the housing executive were trying to influence um, planning by saying, no, we don't need any social housing and telling developers not to do that, that's messing about the system. I'm, I'm going to ask Paul to deal with that, but, but that, that certainly is news to me. What you're mm. saying is news to me because the, the, I mean, the, the raw data as to how we begin to understand where our housing need is, is the lists of people who are I mean, that's the, that's the evidence that, that we have. So I, 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 I'm, I'm very interested to hear your, your, your comment on that. In terms of, the, but that fundamentally then goes to how we shape the whole, the social housing development programme, which has to be based on the evidential need that is coming through, through there. Yeah. Do you want to I mean, that, that would be really concerning. It would yes, be important to take the details of that, of yep. that, that accusation off you, really. Um, yep. Because otherwise, it's been really important for housing policy in Northern Ireland for some time that we, we the, the, the confidence people have in the housing executives' independent assessment of where housing is needed, that has been maintained. And so um, that is the heart of the development programme. Basically, people who present housing executive offices with a housing need, that data is immediately passed through to become the assessment of where housing is needed. If so. I would need to look at. I don't. I can't be familiar with exactly what, yep. how they assess the need in your area. But if, if yeah. you hand over the details, I'm very interested in that. Can I just follow up on that as well? Because I have similar circumstances when it comes to the likes of four bedroom houses and things like that, where we're seeing new plans for new developments. Um, certainly within my own area too, in North Belfast, where um, and we're told there's no and there's no housing need for that. Oh, no, now, quite often it is because people have not put themselves on the list because they know there isn't any. Yeah. So. There's, there's trying to find that fine line between you know, who are on the list and what the need is, and those people out there, same with people with disabilities, aren't putting their names on the list because they know there's, there's, there's no properties available uh, as, as with the larger housing. So I think sometimes we need to look at well, the demographics of the area, maybe more even than, than the housing list, and the same really point quickly, as well. The same sort of thing where people in rural areas yep. go, so for example, in my own area, somebody goes in to Maherfelt, but they want a house in the clock room or mm. Desert Martin and they're told you're never going to get one there. So they put down where felt so then yeah. those areas then are seen as, as having no demand. This is distorting mm. the market. Yeah. yeah, so it is. Kelly's right. You just well, said there's I, distorting it. Um, I think that this is the, this is very instructive. Very happy to take those your your your, your comments, your observations and your insights uh, away into our conversations with the housing executive. Uh, yeah. uh, on the on the issue of rural areas, just to say that um, the chair of the housing executive and I were out uh, I think about three weeks ago um, with the rural um, community network um, with um, 
as Kate Clifford, and uh, and I find I find that a really invaluable um, session to understand what was what was going on and some of the particular issues that uh, well cr criticism of the of the underperformance in terms of the SHDP in terms of delivering its target numbers uh, within new build within. Uh, the sector which I agreed um, with Aidan um, within um, uh, RCN to take back and to try and understand what, what is going under there and why is this why is this slipping off? You know, that we, we, we sadly we didn't make our total object target last year. As Paul said, we were slightly under that, but actually there's a bit then about the small percentage that is in there too. But that's only part of the answer because what I also got an insight into then was the issue around the private rental sector in rural areas as well. So mm -hmm. I think that that was. That was very valuable, and you don't get that stuff sitting at a desk. No. no. Sorry, Kelly. Um, no, absolutely. I'm glad I brought that up, and we have, have evidence of that. Um, well, you know that I have concerns about the private sector because more and more of the private sector are turning away, refusing housing benefit tenants, mm -hmm. and a lot of it's to do with the five-week wait, because you know it's it's people getting in debt and not paying their bills. But what I wanted to ask about is. Um, Sorry, bear with me. Um, it's the policy setting. Right. Um, the, the housing executive, there's certain elements within it, obviously policy setting, you know, yes. where houses are put and things like that. There. With the consideration of the housing executive moving forward, will that move back into the department or will that still stay within some sort of body? Um, I'm concerned that government and government departments yes. are where policy setting should stay. Um, and it shouldn't be out because we will have in future, if it is a, a social housing type model for the housing executive, it will be setting policy for itself when it's got competitor market there. A, a very support, I think, that Paul wants to come I, I can, in. I mean, it's, it's a question for the minister, and it's probably a question for the all ministers in the executive because it would be a big, it would be a big decision. But um, for, for the housing executive to decide where new build needs to go is not a policy decision. That's an operational decision that government has long thought it was really important to have arm, at arm's length from the point of political control. And um, one suspects when, when, when ministers and the executive come to consider this issue, if they get to the, the options for the future of the housing executive, that will remain a really important consideration. But it's not a policy issue to decide where new build goes. Well, I'm thinking also of things like that disabled facilities grant that I am banging my head up against a wall with. Um, there has been a review in the housing executive of the disabled facilities grant. Yeah. Really? Um, should have really been outside the housing executive to look at the disabled facilities grant and how it's being delivered. Um, that's what I'm worried about, that type of policy. Well, it I think it's, it might be important because we've had both the major adaptations and the DFG process discussed here this morning. Both have been the subject of change within the housing executive, determined by the housing executive. Operational improvements. Um, you now, it's important that the housing executive can do that because, you know, it, it should always strive to improve its services. We could probably it'd be useful for us to provide the committee with the performance data that shows how well those changes have, have improved both grant services. Okay. Uh, if, if, if there is a continued pattern yes, of failing to improve, then yes, of course, there is a requirement I'll, for external I'll give you review. An, I'll give you an department. example. But the, department over, sorry to, but the department oversees this performance in these areas very, because, very closely at yeah, the moment. Yes. I know, and it's been looked at by the audit office who say that it's not achieving. Um, one of the examples I'll, I'll bring to you is, for instance, the list of builders that are open for people for a disabled facilities grant to come from whatever the intermediary body is, Radius or whoever. Um, the majority of those builders no longer provide disabled facility grant work. Um, the majority of those builders have been complaining about the quantity surveyor levels of, of money that's been talked about that's set by the housing executive that's completely out with market values. And recently we know that there's been an increase of 9%, I think, increase on, on the cost of materials because of that. Um, but it's also the lack of recognition that you can actually have more than one child in a house that's disabled, and I know that the review looked at that. I have one case that's gone on now for four years because of the lack of process. These things take forever, and the result is that people are having to spend more time in hospital and respite care because the Disabled Facilities Grant has been awarded 
but is not being delivered upon. Mm -hmm. There has to be an accountability here, and it has to be somebody outside the housing executive doing it. It's not happening at the moment. Sorry. Um, but the last thing I just wanted to ask is, um, Louise, thank you very much for explaining about the Supporting People Board. Can I just ask, is there anybody that's a beneficiary of supporting people on that board with you, or is it all just managers? Um, board, she's coming in straight away there. It's supported by a uh, client reference group, which is... Um, Do they sit on that board? Uh, they don't sit on the board, no. Um, I don't think that would. I think it's appropriate for the Department of Housing Executive and the other departments and the health trusts to have a discussion that they can have, aided by then the input from okay. the provider under, sector. Under co-production and co-design, I'll just remind you that co-production and co-design doesn't mean that somebody sits above and beyond people that they're in at that decision-making process. So I would welcome if there's review of that to add people into that board who are not. Um, just Indeed, and, and, and the, but our client reference group is an acknowledgement of that. It, there is still accountability, of course. But it, if there's a difference from being referenced and actually being there at the decision making and having part of that decision making power, it's a very different thing. It changes, and that's what um, all of the parties have said that they want going forward is co-production and co-design. That doesn't mean to say we'll decide and we'll, we'll ask you about it. It means that they're at the table too. Understand that I understand the point you're, you're making. We have uh, we have taken uh, you know it is a program board with a strong project pace, part of which includes the accountability. When I'm working with my colleague Clark Bailey, and he asks me, well, what is the department doing? And I ask him, what's the housing executive doing to move those all of those recommendations forward? So I do I do take your point, and I think that that's that, that's something that we will yep. take away. Thank you. Um, okay. there, there is a piece for me anyway that as we get, so just sorry, a final postscript, that as we get supporting people's, the governance and the delivery increasingly into the right space, I see this as part of the wider part of governance that the department does of the housing executive. In, in a way, at the moment, it is getting special treatment, but, uh, apart from any other bit. And, and when the trajectory should be about it, Fully, I believe, fully mainstreamed. Others might differ, but fully mainstreamed into our broad governance of the housing executive. <coughs> and in that sense, then the engagement, I think that opens up a different way of having that engagement that you're talking yep. about, Kelly. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. The, the, the lady, sir, took on or raised a lot of the points that, that I was going to around the, the allocation scheme. I'm, I'm interested in the one that Kelly and Emma had both touched on there about where houses are. Built or, or, or where the housing executives seek to build houses or, or approve or put their input matter on applications to build houses and other applications in other areas. And it seems to be sort of it's trying to discern the difference between need and demand. And they will look at what the demand is, and there'll be no demand for social housing in an area where there is no uh, social housing. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 yet as soon as someone maybe speculates about and does come in with an application and works with the housing executive and gets permission to build 12 houses in Eglinton, say a village outside the dairy, where there had been no demand for social housing, that then demand goes through the roof. It's kind of a field of dreams sort of thing. If you build it, they will come. They will come. Uh -huh. It's also sort of mindful of kids playing football in the playground. You know, wherever the ball is, that, that, that's where uh, they will all go. I don't know how exactly that sort of not could be cracked, but it, it, there is definitely a piece of work right, doing yeah. that. Actually, maybe by looking at private rental in particular areas, uh, the, the, the levels of it as opposed to socially. So at a, a higher a higher level, and as part of our work with the local development plans, you know that the housing executive provides information on a housing market area basis about what its projections are and those are based on housing growth, growth indicators. And the housing executive has just included some research and we've been working with them on this for a few years about a move to a more sophisticated way of doing that um, based on the Scottish model of housing needs and demand assessment. And it looks at it takes the overall growth of households, which is you know, the housing growth indicators. So that is people getting older and becoming of an age where they're adults now that want their own house immigration, net off of immigration, um, average break up in houses and things like that. So it takes all that sort of stuff and produces a number for how many new households you think there would be. Um, in Scotland what they've done then is looked at the sort of income level of those new households and said well this proportion would be expected to buy their own houses. This proportion might end up 
you know, in the private rented sector, and they can afford that. This proportion would, in Scotland, they have intermediate rent products, so, you know, if we put intermediate housing in, in this proportion, we'll need social housing, otherwise they won't be able to put a roof over their head, because such is their economic situation. Um, so we could look at taking on something like that, so the Housing Executive has done some research around that, and that would go into the planning system, the overall, and the planning of houses. So that would be a more sophisticated way than what we're doing at the minute, which is says is sort of a top-down meets bottom-up. And the bottom-up bit is really who's asking. So there's issues around who's asking who's not. Yeah. No, I'm glad that they, that they hear uh, that's getting done. I know the executive had to be cautious too against speculation and that there are in areas where there's a huge uh, need for, for social housing. Developers will come in and think by sticking a, a social housing sticker on an application anywhere, <laughs> regardless of whether it's even the, the zoned land or not, that it'll have no difficulty getting through a planning committee at council who are acutely aware of the housing need uh, in that council area. So I know that's a difficult sort of one for the housing executive to tread to. And then on, Emma raised a very uh, valid question there. It was in terms of, I suppose, the, the net increase or the, in housing stock per year is, is less than the number of new builds. Uh, in, in, in any year given to, to the number of houses are still being sold. Are these flagged up like again in local areas or, or geographically? Could you say, oh, cheapers in that area, more and more people are buying their homes and, and, and have sort of been a moratorium put on right to buy in particular areas as a result of that, where, where they're selling faster than they're going up? Um, I. I the department has the, the housing executive and the housing associations operate these schemes. The department can approve a proposed amendment to these schemes submitted by either of those authorities. It would be unlikely that um, you know a, a supply concern, uh, an amendment proposed on that basis, uh, could withstand a legal challenge. Yeah. In a sense, the right to buy is exactly that. The, the exact, you know, that, that is the current settlement in legislation. Setting aside the supply issues, that's what the Northern Ireland Executive is currently, until it changes the legislation, if it does, has determined should be the, 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 the right of the social tenant to buy the home. Really, if you, if you took that right away from a tenant because of where they live, no, which is not something that. they can really, and un, under the current policy settlement, I think that would be a difficult amendment for the Department to pass. But, but say, for example, that was happened where the social houses were selling like hot cake <coughs> and you didn't have a uh, new build there with the department and the housing executive and associations provide all the stops to, to start trying to build more there or well, I mean, does it be flagged indeed. up? Indeed, so you would you would see you'd see the sort of the circle working in this case. You you would the overall reduction supply would lead to an increase in need which would direct the new build programme more at that area. This is what this has happened in North Belfast. This is uh, you know, whilst we talk about there being an acute housing need in that area over the last twenty years. 2,000 social homes, something like that, have been tenants have accessed their right to buy because that's what the policy of the executive has maintained should should be the case. Now that has meant then that more social build has taken place in in North Belfast, but but, but not enough. Third North Belfast got another shout out again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have one member left down to talk, and that's Robin. I'm conscious of time, so if any other members still haven't or want to put their hand up, <coughs> no. Robin. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I do apologise for being out of the room uh, for most of your presentation. Uh, I apologise for that. Chair, you, you did raise the issue that uh, affects your area and affects Andy and myself probably the most. That's of the tar block area, and, and that is of, of, of major concern. I'm glad that you uh, highlighted the Northern Ireland Housing Executive brand, because I do agree with you. Uh, they're a much maligned body, uh, but I find them to be a very accessible body. Um, and I have no difficulty meeting with them and, and talking with them. Don't always get the answers I want, but uh, at least I, I get that. I would like to, in terms of um, securing the future of NIHE, um, just raise a couple of uh, areas. First of all, the tower blocks that 
will be demolished. Uh, and the footprint of the tower block and the surrounding area, does that become an asset of NIHE or what happens to that uh, piece of ground? Because certainly in the east of the city, public land for housing is very much, uh, I mean, it's any sites that become available are either small sites or they are zoned for industrial use or whatever. Um, wouldn't preclude a change, but there they are and what they are there. And again, in terms of securing the future, is there any consideration being given to NIHE being allowed to build houses again? Um, you can see by my colleague's inclined head. <laughs> <laughs> he would very much like to answer those questions. But I think on the, on the first one, um, Robin, that. I mean, having spent some time engaging with Professor Roberts on this, I mean, housing executives are very keen that where they are intending to demolish tar blocks, to look at the needs in the area in terms of reprovision, which would, uh, in, in many ways, were and, and uh, that, I suppose, in a way, would depend on each discrete area. Um, but um, on the technical issue about ownership of of, of, of land, I know Paul would, would would advise me better. Yeah, the the the. The housing executive will own the, the stock and the land. When they demolish, um, they, will remain, they will retain ownership of the land. At that point, they'll go through a process to establish what's the best option, a business case process to establish what's the best option for put back. Um, the um, put back will often be less because it's not going to be a tower block necessarily, and a tower block is very high density. It will be less, often, often less. Um, um, what tend, this is to answer your second question. What tends to happen in this kind of business case process, given the current borrowing advantages of housing associations mm -hmm. and the rules of public expenditure, is yeah. the option that is best value for money mm -hmm. for government yeah. is that the housing association we'll be, we'll will, will come top, and so therefore the housing executive's land will pass into the ownership, will be acquired, mm -hmm. purchased by the housing association, and it will, it will develop the put back. Mm -hmm. um, for the housing executive to build again requires a business case that shows that it provides the best value for money for, uh, option for government, which is a difficulty whilst housing associations retain this, this borrowing advantage. It goes back to the heart, the nature of the housing executive currently, it goes back to so many things around ONS classification. I hope that sort of answers your question. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> it, it, it does, um, although I, I do think in terms of securing the future of NIHE, you know, you're either I assume talking about a much smaller organisation for the future, um, uh, and not the, the the future isn't what the organisation was originally uh, established for. Well, not if I might, not necessarily. If there is a value for money case for an organisation that has ninety thousand units or a hundred thousand units, um, whilst the cost to government of new build to achieve that might be more, if there was non-monetary benefits to that, then that would be. That would, that would that would conceive of the the housing executive building yeah. again. And, and 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 just as a final thing, the professor um, Peter Roberts has left me in no doubt whatsoever that he cer he certainly, the chair of the housing executive, aspires to to build. And I'm yeah. sure call members around the table. I've been that. in many meetings with him. Where he, he is, he's very positive. He, he, he is, and he re really believes now. Sinead, do you want yeah, to make a point there? Yeah, thanks, sure. Just in the back of Robin's question, can the housing executive legally build a house today if they wanted to? Yes, they could. Right. Right, there's no further members have uh, indicated. I want to ask a very short question. You can answer me with a yes or no, even or it's nothing to do with us, if it might be. Um, <laughs> it's around social clauses when it comes to to building, whether that's housing association or whoever is, okay. is building for social housing, and the social clauses. I know previously, um, a few years ago, speaking whenever the re uh, a housing association was building in Rathcoole, I spoke to them then about social clauses, and they said they weren't fit for purpose for them to use. So I'm talking about about um, having conversations with their local FA colleges about upskilling our people, giving them trades for life, um, and you know which will which will enable so many people within our communities if they have trades for life, and that could be a way done through yourselves and the Department of Economy looking at social clauses. So just putting that out there. Thank you, and I don't have a yes or no answer, but I will, for other reasons, I will be okay. very interested to take that away. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Look, thank you very much. It's been a good session, and we're, we've thank we've you. made it in not too bad time. Yeah, better than I expected. There, there we go. Well, thank you, Chair and Deputy Chair, and all all members for your for your time. And uh, 
I know you'll see us again when you need us. So we'll no be doubt. Back up to see you. Thank you. No doubt. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, we've got some statutory rules to do, so we're going to move on to those. Um, and just uh, bear with me because a couple of them are tongue twisters for me today again. So, <laughs> any help will be greatly appreciated on some of the pronunciation. So we'll move on to item number eight, which is Social Security Benefits Operating Order Northern Ireland 2020. Um, the clerk has provided a brief memo on page 96 outlining the purpose of each of the statutory rules. The first um, SL is the Social Security Benefits Operating Order Northern Ireland 2020. Can I refer members then to page 97 of the meeting pack um, are, and ask members are they content or do they have any queries on the first one? Yeah, can I? I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I do have a query. Just Universal Fund, because they take the five week period where they measure um, the amount of money that goes into a person's bank account. Yeah. I would really like to have clarification if there is a lump sum payment made, will that have a detrimental impact on the payment of universal credit? Okay. I don't know if that's recognised as, as not being income per se, but given how quickly yeah. It, yeah. you know and we know from that that uh, event we attended with the, exactly. the UC um, yeah that that is an issue. Um, we can, can we, if we time, then we can put that back then for a week to get further information on that. Not a problem. That's perfectly fine. Um, can I then refer members to 102 of the meeting pack um, and ask members are any comments or queries on that? So this is the one where I'm going to have to say the very long word. So absent, are we happy enough with that? 102 still has a lump pump. No, it's oh, sorry, it still is. Yeah, it's, 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 uh... Sorry. Not reading the thing properly here. Okay, are we going to put that one then as well? Join that as well. And to be honest, that mess of mesothelioma oh. has lump sum in it as well. Okay. Hmm? I just don't know if this is going to have an impact on people if they are getting that um, payment and it's a lump sum. Will there be discretion applied to where the lump sum is coming from? Yeah. from yeah. If they're on universal credit. Yeah. If it's allowed income or, or whether they'll, they'll lose benefit because of it. Okay, we need to get that. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then probably then, um, that was agenda number, and agenda number t 10 was the mesothelioma. I said it. Um, so we're going to put that one back just to get clarification on that. I assume then it's the same with um, item agenda number 11 as well, So, um, which I'll not even begin to pronounce right now. Um, so we can put that back also then until we get clarification. Is that okay, Kirk, or do you want yes, to make comments? No, no that's fine. I'll, uh, so it's clarification whether a lump sum payment will affect Benefit. The, 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 these particular... It falls within the assessment period for anybody that's making a claim. Okay, will it, will it, will it affect any, any additional payment under... Well, it's the assessment period, um, and if somebody's already on universal credit, yeah. if they get that lump sum payment... It's considered as income. income. Or, yeah. 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 And we, we've, we've also raised the query previously in how that affects even around holiday periods whenever there is a double payment that's through right. no fault mm -hmm. of the applicant. So I, I don't know whether it's... I think we can go back to clarity for whether we can get any change to that at this stage, but I just want to put on record that not just a lump sum, whether it's not from an income perspective, but also in relation to employers, okay. double paying per se, in particular around holidays. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, well then we'll bring those back then, again, yeah. hopefully next week with a bit more clarification on that. That's okay then. We then move on to agenda item 12, which is our forward work programme. Members will find that at page 114 um, of your meeting packs. Um, so it says, as you know, members, we have had by large not been taking briefings from stakeholders, welfare medication briefings being the exception. Um, uh, the Strategic Away Day, I, I would hope, would be a chance for us to determine what our priorities are as a committee as well, because um, uh, there will be certain things we as committee members want to see going forward. Um, so I, I think up until then we'll continue with the approach that we've had until we get to the Away Day. Um, we would also um, had a number of requests to brief the committee on a range of issues uh, and we committed to revisiting these requests. Are members content that the clerk brings an update forward work that includes briefings from those organisations that have already contacted us? Yeah. Um, and are members agreed that we go forward on that basis? Yes, please. Okay. Item agenda number, item agenda number 13 is AOB. Any other business members relevant to committee? 
No, good stuff. Item agenda number 14, date, time, location of next meeting. Next meeting will take place here, 10 a.m. next Thursday, the 5th of March, 2020, in room 29. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you. 29.